Hi, and thank you for joining us today for our Nuclear and Uranium Conference. The entire world is going green and the driving forces behind this movement will be electrification and clean energy. Countries cannot meet their clean energy targets without nuclear energy. And with this in mind, we have brought together some outstanding individuals and companies for you to learn from. Our first speaker is our conference sponsor, John Chapeglia of Sprott Inc., followed by Phil Williams of Consolidated Uranium, David Cates of Denison Mines, Alyssa Cochran of Copernet Global, Ross McElroy of Fission Uranium, Tim Gabrick of Viso Energy, Pierre Jander of WMC Energy, Lee Courier of NextGen Energy, John Cash of UR Energy, and we conclude with Mike Ilkin of Sachem Co Partners. As a reminder, we will have an open chat on the right-hand side of the screen, so say hello, ask a question, or leave a comment. In addition, we will be running polls in the open chat throughout the conference to get your views on nuclear energy and uranium, so be sure to keep an eye out for them. I want to thank our corporate sponsor, Sprott Inc., a global leader in precious metals and energy transition investments. Check out their website to learn more about their many products focused on energy transition. I hope you enjoy the conference. Hi, John. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Toronto? Hey, thanks for having me. Things are good in Toronto. John, you and your team have been very busy developing new products for investors to capitalize on the energy transition theme, and I want to discuss these new products. But before we do that, let's spend a few minutes on uranium, seeing how this is a uranium conference. And why don't we just start with an update on the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, or SPUT, when you and your team took it over in July of 2021, it's hard to believe that was a year and a half ago, but the NEV was 600 million and it held approximately 18 million pounds of uranium. Where does it stand now? Yeah, so uh, it's been a, a very busy start to 2023 and I'm, I'm very, uh, and my team are very happy with that because last year obviously was a bit of a challenging year, but the trust right now uh, just recently crossed the 60 million pound mark. So. We continue to uh, take investor interest uh, when we're trading at a premium to NAV and we've been stacking more material and the, and the stockpile continues to grow slowly. So um, yeah, we definitely think that 2023 has, has ushered in, I think, uh, you know, it's kind of a new year, new hope, new expectations that the sector is going to continue to uh, move along. It's what we believe is it's, it's bull market. And the fundamentals, um, if you talk to many, you know, industry, long-time industry uh, participants, um, many of them will say to you that we've not seen the, the fundamentals as good as this in, in their 40-year career. So, you know, we're relatively new in the segment, but when you hear people that have been in the segment for 30 or 40 years talk about what's going on around them, you know, from a, from a fundamental perspective, from an energy policy perspective, from some of the geopolitical risk perspective um i think it's a very interesting time to be to be investing in uranium so once again just to summarize you went from 18 million pounds to over 60 million pounds that's a lot of uranium yeah it is a, it is a lot of uranium but i think uh, to put it into context we're seeing a big pickup in demand for uranium globally um, last year one of the uh, industry consultants published uh, that 114 million pounds in 2022 were sold to utilities uh, under long-term contracts. We think that number is understated. We, do, we think the real number is substantially higher than that. And, and the reason we say that is because Cameco alone has told us that they've done about 80 million pounds uh, through long-term contracts last year alone. So I, I, we think that uh, the industry clearly has done more than 34 million in total. So if you if you think about all the off off market transactions that are also happening, we think that number is, is substantially higher than the 114. 
Why that is important? Well, we think it's a really key signal. Uh, first of all, it's the highest amount that utilities have procured in the last 10 years. More importantly, it's a clear signal that utilities are feeling much better about their operations and that they're finally coming back to reload their inventories. You know, we know the spot market is the smaller of the two markets. The term market is really where the, the bulk of the contracting happens. And utilities coming back to the to contract market, to the long-term contract market, buying larger quantities and with larger durations, with uh, you know market-based prices. I think all, those are all very healthy signs and signals that the health of the industry is recovering. We think this is a, a key part of the thesis that the industry needs to recover from from a multi-year bear market, and that we're still in the early stages of of this recovery. As you mentioned, the spot product has been relatively busy here in the last few weeks, and spot uranium is up 8% of the year, give or take. And I want to get a better sense of what's happening in the spot market. And is there still pounds available, or is the market very tight? If Would you be able to acquire a million or two million pounds if you had to? Well, we've acquired about two million pounds this year, so I think it's fair to say that there has been material available to us. It clearly ebbs and flows. Some days you don't find a lot. Other days, you know, people are willing to offer a new material. I think there is some seasonality in terms of, you know, you start the new year. We saw this last year as well. Um, and, you know, there tends to be a little bit more mobile inventory towards the beginning of the year. So we have been able to procure. As you said, the price is up about 8%. We're at, we've gone from about $48 a pound on January 1st to uh, just shy of $52 today. So, you know, that's that's obviously a good start to the year. Now, what's driving that, obviously, is a lot of utility demand in the background. You know, it's hard for us to kind of piece it all together because, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these transactions are done off-market, meaning they're not reported to the marketplace. These contracts, we believe, are pretty sizable and they're, and they're growing in number as utilities think very differently about their long-term needs as reactors are getting life extensions, reactors are coming back online, for example, in Japan new reactors are being built around the world and, and I'm not even talking about you know the next generation of reactors which are still several years away. Now you layer on that the uncertainty around potential sanctions or retaliatory sanctions that you know as we're coming up to the one year anniversary of, of the invasion of Ukraine is still making utilities nervous. Um, there are numerous bills floating around proposing different actions to sanction uh, Russian uranium as well as Russian um, enrichment and conversion services. These bills, you know, they're being talked about, but at this point, uh, they don't seem to be imminent. Um, and I think the reason why they haven't been implemented thus far, um, uh, in, in contrast to many other commodities and services that have been sanctioned, is that clearly the utilities went to their respective governments and said, look, we've signed these agreements with the Russians. Uh, if we if we don't continue to take delivery, uh, we could be at risk in terms of, of, of securing enough conversion and enrichment to keep our plants running. And that obviously caused governments to take a pause and, and reflect on the reality that we've offshored a lot of this supply chain to Russia over the, over the last few decades. And that in order to reshore this supply chain, it will take anywhere from kind of two to probably six years. The additional capacity that the Western countries need uh, can be built, but it will only be built uh, if there's long-term contracts awarded to them at obviously, you know, in economic prices to make the capital investments necessary to, to basically scale up these operations in France and Canada and, uh, and the United States. So we think ultimately there will be some form of sanctions. We think it will be a transition period. Um, that doesn't mean that utilities aren't thinking about the potential risks. Uh, whether it's you know logistical risks, insurance risks of, of ship you know shipping material, uh, I think I think all of these geopolitical factors have clearly acted as a catalyst to make utilities think uh, very differently about the potential disruptions of risks to uh, to their supply of uranium and, and different services. You raised some very good points, uh, especially from a geopolitical point of view, and, and the U.S. is beholden to, to Russia right now for uranium and its various services that it offers. And I guess there's really not much you can do because these are long-term effects, right? You just can't 
wake up one day and say, okay, I'm no longer going to deal with Russia because you have no place else to go to get the pounds. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, you know, there's a very uh, interesting report that was uh, published by the White House in uh, June of 2021 that basically lays out the blueprint for reshoring a number of critical industries. Those involve things like pharmaceuticals, computer chips, critical minerals, uh, critical minerals for batteries. Um, so the U.S. government has clearly acknowledged that they can no longer rely on certain nations for these supply chains. These are uh, key elements and minerals related to energy security as well as natural, national security. And you're starting to see this bifurcation happen, this deglobalization, as some people are calling it, and this basically reshoring or reindustrialization that's happening. The what we find really interesting across this broader thematic is that the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense is now starting to make strategic investments in specific companies to ensure this reshoring pro uh, process takes root. So, for example, we've, we've recently seen the Department of Energy make several loans to companies in the lithium space or in the battery materials sector. This is really important to take notice of for investors. When the government starts making equity investments or, or uh, loan, make, extend loans or, or backstop loans to different pu uh, public companies that tells you what they're concerned about. They're clearly concerned about uh, not having places like China or Russia control important supply chains. Uh, rare earths is obviously another topic that people are concerned about. Battery uh, manufacturing for EVs is obviously something that today is dominated by China and, and, and governments in the UK, the EU, Canada, and, and um, the United States are clearly focused on encouraging and incentivizing local primary production of these materials, the processing, because many of these minerals have to be turned into chemical form. So you need key uh, processing uh, capacity. And then obviously the last step is manufacturing of the end product and putting it inside of a finished good. The Inflation Reduction Act uh, is clearly focused on this reshoring, the tax incentives related to electric vehicles, renewable energy um, are very clear to us what, what is going on uh, behind, behind, the, you know, behind the, uh, the surface, underneath the surface. So we think uranium is another element that, the, that uh, governments around the world are, are very focused on. The U.S. You know, made its first million pound investment in uranium to, to establish a strategic uranium reserve. You know, in the past, the U.S. government held large quantities of uranium. Um, that obviously has changed over the years, and, and uh, their initial investment, we think, is a, is a good sign that they're thinking about the critical nature of many of these materials. You raise a lot of very interesting points, and as a reminder to our viewers, the U.S. is the largest consumer of uranium. They consume approximately 50 million pounds a year. So, and as you mentioned, they did start a strategic uranium fund, but a million pounds is rather insignificant compared to what their annual needs are. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, last year, uh, U.S. Uh, primary production of uranium was, was just under 400,000 pounds. The year before it was 20,000 pounds. So there's, you know, the wheels are slowly turning in terms of, uh, you know, turning primary production uranium back on. Many companies are, are, are in the process of evaluating whether they can do that and at what price points uh, they need to see as incentives to turn these operations back online. We think it's inevitable there will be more production of uranium in the United States. Um, obviously in the interim, the United States is relying heavily on, on key countries like Canada, and Australia for their for their uranium needs. Um, so, you know, I think uh, if you look at what's happening in, in some of the uranium states, like Wyoming, for example, historical producer, uh, you know, Senator Brasso there is, is very keen on, on uh, restarting their, their local industry in uranium. So that's a great overview of the spot, the term, and also some geopolitics in there. But why don't we move on now? I'm curious to hear what investors are saying. You speak to institutional investors all over the world. And given the positive backdrop and also the move that we've seen year to date in the uranium price, are you getting a lot more inbounds? Yeah, we saw we saw a noticeable pickup um, just right coming out of the, the start of the new year in terms of investors, institutional investors, 
uh, reaching out to us, um, either existing investors that had signaled to us uh, that they have been accumulating positions in, in the Mediterranean Trust over the fourth quarter, which was great to see. They saw the, uh, the value opportunity there when the trust was trading at a discount to NAV. But we've also had some new investors reach out to us saying, hey, this is an interesting uh, thesis to us. We're doing research on it. We'd like to talk to you about it. And uh, obviously, that, that's, that's great too, seeing some new people come into the sector. I think in general, um, we've seen a sea change in the level of interest related to uranium and energy transition materials and mining the last couple of years from institutions. Uh, prior to that, I, I don't think there was much interest whatsoever, uh, other than a few pockets of some contrarian investors. But we're starting to see more and more investors interested in this topic. Now, why are they interested in the topic? Because there's big energy policy shifts that are already underway that are going to incentivize uh, significant investment. So as, as, um, as we talked about b before we got on, you know, certain, certain uh, OEMs, these are the car makers, for example, starting to make strategic investments down into their supply chains to ensure security of supply. You know, the car makers have pretty lofty goals in terms of transitioning away from inter internal combustion engine vehicles to EVs. Some in some countries is being mandated. You know, the European Union clearly wants to phase out entirely sales of new ICEs in the future. You know, and if we want to do that, if we have any hope of doing that, we're obviously going to have to reinvent all of our supply chains. And and critical minerals and raw materials are 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 obviously very top of mind for the publicly traded companies, the private companies, as well as the local governments. They want this to happen. And they're they're providing the right incentives uh, and, and tax credits to to spur on this local production and manufacturing. The big issue is obviously uh, permitting regulations. Mining is very uh, uh, you know complicated, and we obviously have to do it sustainably. I will also make another comment that when we talk to investors that are focused on energy transition, there is a heightened level of awareness and focus on ensuring that these supply chains are clean. They do not want to be investing in mining companies that are supporting or enabling the energy transition and finding out that these companies are, are destroying the environment or local communities. So there's a very high standard being placed on these companies focused on these energy transmit, transition materials. And I think, I think that's very important. It's very important to encourage investment in the sector if people feel it can be done responsibly. So John, we discussed the spot and what's happening there in terms of flows. What is going on with the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF? Sure. Well, the uranium stocks had a very challenging year last year. We've, we've talked to a lot of investors that uh, clearly were frustrated. You know, they saw the uranium price end the year with a small single-digit percentage gain, and yet the stocks were down 15 or more percent, depending on on the company. This year, we've seen a nice bounce in the uranium stocks. So, for example, in the month of January, they were up 15% on average, which is a great, a great bounce. I think people, you know, are starting to realize that the commodity price and the related uh, miners are obviously two different animals. The commodity price is different. Uh, the commodity has different fundamentals. Um, the stocks uh, obviously have very uh, company-specific things going on within them, but they also tend to have a moderate level of correlation to the just general stock market. And so when you see general stock market sell-offs, it doesn't matter you know, how positive the fundamentals are for the commodity, sometimes the, those related stocks can sell off. And we saw that last year. We're starting to see the uranium stocks outperform the general stock market. I think that's a very healthy sign that interest is coming back into the sector and people are saying, hey, the stocks look kind of cheap here relative to the commodity, which is starting to improve again. You know, I think the stocks look like a better uh, a better opportunity. Now, having said that, we're not seeing massive flows come into our uranium mining sector uh, ETFs. We've, ha we've had maybe $25 million of net sales. The largest competitor, by the way, is actually down about $30 million for the year. So net-net, it's kind of a wash. So there isn't a huge amount of capital coming into the sector, but the stocks the stocks have obviously performed pretty well year-to-date so far. So um, 
starting to see some improve, improvement in relative performance, but we're not seeing the money kind of flood in again. I think people are clearly sitting on the sidelines, not just in uranium stocks, but with many, many different sectors. Uh, people are still nervous about Fed policy. Are we getting close to the end of the tightening cycle? Are they going to keep raising rates and putting more pressure on equity markets? And until we get a little bit more clarity on, on whether we're getting closer to a pause, I think markets are going to remain volatile and money is going to is going to be you know ebbing and flowing in and out. You and your team recently rolled out a new product, the Junior Miners ETF. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about this product and also how it compares to the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF. Yeah, sure. So the the Sprott uh, Junior Uranium Miners ETF uh, launched at the beginning of February, and we just you know from all of our discussions with investors over the last couple of years, realized that there's a segment of, of investors. We're very focused on the physical commodity, uh, a group of investors that want to take a, a broad approach with uh, across the producers, developers, exploration companies, and, and hold a little bit of, of the physical uh, uranium itself, and that's that's the uh, Sprott Uranium Miners uh, Index. And then finally, there's a group of investors that, let's call these guys the, uh, the Super Bowls, who want kind of maximum operating leverage, ma maximum kind of optionality, to a higher uranium price and expiration upside. Um, so what we've basically done is worked with NASDAQ to create an index that focuses exclusively on the development companies, the kind of smaller producers, um, and the and the expiration companies. So if you want to basically focus on the, the segments of the, of the industry that um, have in a bull market historically uh, the, the most operating leverage, but albeit the most volatility and lower levels of liquidity. We wanted to basically provide a range of options across the uranium spectrum. John, that's a good overview of your uranium products, but you also developed three other products that benefit from the energy transition. Why don't we start with the Sprott Energy Transition ETF? What exactly is it and how can it help investors? Yeah, so we, uh, again, we worked with NASDAQ to co-develop an index that we we thought was a very good representation of the types of minerals that we think are going to be in critical demand to enable energy transition. So what is what does that all that mean? So we think that companies involved in lithium production, uh, copper production, uranium production, nickel, cobalt, copper, uh, these are all critical minerals for either the generation of electricity in cleaner forms. So those could be everything from obviously nuclear power plants, solar uh, uh, farms, and, and wind farms. Um, and what do you need for those? Well, you obviously need your things like uranium, you need silver for solar panels, et cetera. Then you, we have to think about, okay, you generate this power, how do you move it around? Well, copper is obviously the key transmission element. So copper uh, is, is critical for transmission, but it's also critical for Things like EVs, which use much more copper in them than traditional ICE. And then when you think about the last stage of the cycle, which is storing energy, and, and that basically comes down to batteries. So if you think about batteries for EVs, what do those require? Well, they obviously require lithium, uh, nickel, manganese, cobalt, uh, graphite. Uh, so we're focused on the upstream companies that we believe uh, are best positioned to deliver these critical minerals. So we're focused on upstream companies only, not midstream and downstream. Um, and so it's a pure play. These provide pure play exposure to upstream companies related to energy transition materials. John, spot li lithium has exploded in price in the last few years. It was up over 400% in 2021. It was up over 150% in 2022, and that's all being driven by the surge in EV demand. And you developed another product for investors to capitalize on the growth in EVs and also the lithium price, and that is the Lithium Miners ETF. Why don't you tell us about this product? Yeah, I mean, lithium is, a, is obviously, a, a, I think, a, a, an element a lot of people are, are aware of. Lithium-ion batteries are obviously the key technology for many of the things that we use in our day-to-day -day lives. But where the big use of, uh, or the big increase in, in usage related to lithium is going to come from over the next 20-odd years is going to be, obviously, EVs. So whether you have lithium phosphate iron batteries, uh, which are the dominant uh, form in China, 
uh, or nickel-based uh, cathodes, which are uh, preferred in, in Western markets. Lithium is the common element across both of those key battery technologies. Uh, we saw the price of lithium over the last two years essentially go parabolic on us. Uh, it was the best performing commodity over the last two years. We have since seen the price moderate a little bit. And so what was driving that, what was driving those price gains? Well, it was basically shortage. In 2022, we saw record high EV sales around the world. And we believe EV sales are essentially hitting a tipping point right now. Uh, what I mean by that is that when you look at the adoption historically of different technologies, when you hit around 10% adoption, that represents a tipping point where essentially the growth accelerates from that point. Greater adoption and acceptance, economies of scale, costs come down, and it basically encourage, encourages more and more adoption. We think EVs are at that point. Obviously, the Inflation Reduction Act um, is going to be a huge catalyst in the United States in terms of providing EV subsidies for made in America uh, EVs. That's that's important. It's not, you know, you can buy an EV with a battery made in China. No, the battery needs to be made in the United States. So this is starting to shift big uh, investments back to the United States in this supply chain, which we think is really important to take note of. Um, Eventually, more lithium will be produced. There's no doubt about it. There is a supply response coming. There is obviously a very high incentive price, but it's going to take time. And this is this is the challenge with commodities in terms of developing them. You know, if you wanted to build a new gigafactory, it may, might take you two or three years. If you want to build a new lithium mine, it might take you eight to 15 years. So you've got this timing mismatch. People want to build more cars. But you know, bringing on these new developments takes a lot of time. As I mentioned, permitting and whatnot is a big issue. So what we see going on right now is obviously kind of a lithium race happening. Uh, places like Nevada, I think, are going to be big winners here. U.S. government is starting to back companies there that because there's because there are lithium deposits that the, the U.S. can basically produce on local soil. Uh, clearly, the U.S. government does not want to be beholden to China. For, for all of its battery manufacturing. And uh, this is gonna obviously spur a lot of investment. It could distort the market a bit when governments start to intervene in free markets, this is possible. But I think this is now kind of a, a key uh, policy goal. Um, and, I would, and I would say to some degree, uh, to say, you know, kind of national security and energy transition, uh, energy security related goals that are driving these policies. And you know, I think I think it's important that um, that we basically reshore a lot of these critical uh, industries that we've unfortunately over the years outsourced places uh, that we cannot be as as uh, we cannot rely on to the same degree going forward. Now you raised some very interesting points, and one of the things that really stands out to me in this sector is how aggressive the OEMs have been in trying to secure lithium supply. Tesla has signed numerous offtake agreements with uh, various producers. Just recently, General Motors made a $650 million investment into Lithium Americas. And I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts. Do you ever think we'll see utilities doing this with uranium producers? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a great question, but I, uh, I, find, I find the equity investments that the OEMs are making into some of these mining companies fascinating. Um, you just wouldn't have imagined this would have happened five years ago. I mean, they, they, they obviously weren't concerned about security of supply. They weren't concerned uh, uh, about procuring materials from, from, from around the world. But obviously, the landscape has changed. Not only that, but obviously, uh, when, when pieces of legislation like the IRA are enacted and those incentives only apply for local production, you need to think very differently. So as a car company, if you want to be able to um, uh, receive those EV subsidy, uh, subsidies, you need to find local production, local sources. So we think that these uh, these mines in, in, let's say, Nevada or whatever in the United States um, are obviously going to be um, very important to, to reshore some of these services. You know, car companies obviously are not in the business of making equity investments in mining companies. I'm sure they, it's the last thing they want to do. But I think they're sufficiently concerned 
about this transition. And it is pretty meaningful when you, when you look at the goals that some of them have uh, over the next 10, 15, 20 years. It's a massive retooling of all of their production. And it's going to require critical minerals to do that. And they want to make sure that they have security of supply. And if it, if it, if it means making an equity investment to get the front of the line to, to secure that production, they're going to do it. Um, I think it's a very telling sign to investors around how important raw materials are uh, in, in order to enable these transitions to happen. And there's one other ETF I want to mention before we wrap it up, but Sprott developed a Junior Copper Miners ETF. And I find this interesting because BHP recently reported their quarterly numbers. It also said in its commentary that it wants to focus on future facing commodities, which includes copper and nickel and less on coal. Maybe you can tell us about this new Copper Miners ETF. Yeah, sure. So we, we think copper um, has a very bullish outlook. You know, it doesn't, it's not going to have the, the kind of wow factor um, and the big moves like you've seen in, in, let's say, lithium or cobalt. But it's a critical, you know, it's kind of the backbone um, of all things related to electrification. Um, the reality is, is it's um, the, big, the big copper mines around the world are, are, are getting old and, and grades have consistently been coming down at some of the largest mines in the world. And we do think that more investment has to happen. So if investors are looking for earlier stage companies and development companies, uh, we looked around the world and we could not find a junior copper mining index anywhere. So we developed one and we thought, okay, yes, there are some copper uh, ETFs out there, but they really focus on a very large contingent of companies, some pure play, some not. And what we wanted to do was provide uh, an opportunity to invest down market cap uh, in the sector, which we think is going to be receiving much more investment uh, over the coming years. So it's, it's a unique vehicle. As I said, we think it's one of a kind, doesn't exist anywhere in the world. And again, we're trying to find solutions to bring to market that are unique, they're innovative, and, and it really leverage the experience that Sprott has in the metals and mining space over multiple decades to put that intelligence into the way these indexes are created. And, and as I said, we formed a partnership with NASDAQ and their indexing group. They used a lot of our knowledge to construct these indexes, um, and we think they're very well thought through. And John, as we wrap up, where can investors go to find out more about these new ETFs? Yeah, so the best place to start your journey um, and do your homework, do your education, there's lots of information there, is sprottetfs.com. That's where you can find uh, information about the ETFs. And then investors looking for information on the Uranium Trust, the best place to start is sprott.com forward slash uranium. Lots of educational material. Most of my job is focused on educating people about these different markets. Um, they're not well understood. They're very early stage in some cases. And, and unfortunately, they're still opaque in, in, some, in some ways. So we really try to, to share as much information with investors uh, as we can and give them a range of, of investment options so they can pick and choose, you know, what's best for their, for their respective portfolios. Well, John, I want to thank you for making time with us today. That was a great overview and a great update on Uranium and a great overview of your new products. Congratulations on that. Once again, thank you. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for continuing all this great educational work. I think there's a lot of interest in the marketplace and information and education are, are really critical right now. Thank you.
Hi, Phil. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Toronto? Everything's great here. A little, little chilly, but uh, doing well. Thanks, James. Good to talk to you. Phil, it's been a few months since we last spoke and you and your team have been very busy acquiring uranium assets. You own a total of 18 assets now in four different countries. And I want to start right there with your overall corporate strategy and what is the objective of acquiring so many assets around the globe? Yeah, thanks. And, and that's a great place to start. Um, and yes, we've been very busy. We've we've you know added those 18 projects uh, in what we think are some of the top jurisdictions around the world of course canada australia the us and argentina but the strategy is really to build a production company and so what we have is is with those projects we've sort of divided them into these three buckets and, and we have near-term production assets and i'm sure we're going to talk in detail about them but in in utah we have past producing mines that can be turned on relatively quickly back into production and then we have in, in the kind of, so that's the first bucket. And, and really the goal of the company is to fill that first bucket with multiple development projects around the world. And where we're gonna fill that bucket up, the projects that we're gonna fill that bucket up with come from the other bucket. So the second bu bucket is a near term, medium term exploration projects. And those are really our Australian and Argentina projects, which we're actively working on right now and we'll do more work this year. And then the third bucket is, is what we call the long-term call option bucket. And so these are projects, and, and the projects are in, in Quebec, in, in, in Virginia, Matouche, and Coles Hill. And these are, you know, world-class potential ore bodies, whether it's be by size or by grade, that for one reason or another have an impediment towards development today. We think that with the, you know, support for nuclear power globally and, and, and thus the requirement for additional uranium mines, that these projects ultimately will have pathways towards production and 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 potentially move into that first bucket and then we also look to add to the to that first bucket through additional m a and uh, again i'm sure we're going to talk about that but we're very busy looking at uh, at a number of different opportunities yeah we will definitely bring that up but as you mentioned your assets fall into three different categories just based on how advanced they are and your most advanced project is tony m it's located in the state of utah you recently completed confirmation drilling and a resource update why don't you provide a brief overview of that resource update what's the size of the resource and, and also the grade sure yeah so so we put that uh, resource out a few months ago and uh, it came in at 8.8 .8 million pounds in total, 6.6 .6 in the indicated category and 2.2 .2 in the inferred category. Importantly, um, the grade is, is very strong. So it's about 0.28% uranium. And, and to put that in context for, for watchers, you know, that's an order of magnitude higher than the average grade project around the world, which would be lower than 0.1. And, and to put it on a, on a gold equivalent basis, it's about a five and a half gram ore body using current uranium and current gold prices. And was the resource update consistent with the previous re resource done by Energy Fuels? Absolutely. So Energy Fuels had a resource that they did in, in, in 2012, and that was based on a significant amount of drilling. And, and I think, you know, we should really highlight how advanced this project is. It was a, it was a past producing mine fully developed, there's 18 miles of underground working, there's 1.5 million feet of drilling into the deposit. So we weren't expecting any surprises. And if you look at that resource, the resource that we put out versus the energy fuels resource at the same cutoff, it was virtually identical. And now that the resource is complete, what are the next steps? Well, yeah, so this is this uh, came out of the report uh, and, and there's a couple of things that we're going to do this year. And we're in the process of, of, of making the plans and we'll, we'll put a press release out shortly to the market detailing them. But it's going to involve a couple of things. So the first is we're going to continue to do some surface drilling. And uh, we do think there's uh, there are some some places to expand the deposit. So we're going to do a service drill program. We're also going to look at opening the underground. One of the one of the key points that came out of the out of the report was that there's vanadium at this project that historically hadn't been sampled or put into a resource. And the vanadium ratio of uran vanadium to uranium ranged in the, in the results that we found ranged from one to one to up to 17 to one. And, and that's typical down in this part of the world. You do get vanadium together with the uranium. And, and so we're gonna open up the, uh, the underground and do some sampling within the existing workings to see if we can move uh, a 
the vanadium into a resource category. And then the third thing we're going to do is we're going to undertake a PEA. And so that's so we understand the exact economics of bringing this project back in production. And another advantage of Tony M is the accessibility to energy fuels, white mesa mill. Can you just expand on the benefits of being so close to this mill? Well, the, the proximity is a huge benefit, of course, and, and but but I think the, the real key is that we actually have access to this mill. And and, and it's a unique situation that we that we find ourselves in with our partnership with Energy Fuels. Energy Fuels has the only currently licensed and operable conventional mill in the US at White Mesa, which is trucking distance to the to the Tony M project. And through our partnership with Energy Fuels, we're the only company, junior company, any company, quite frankly, that has guaranteed access to that mill to process our ore. So it's all well and good to have a project like Tony M that's fully permitted, constructed before, has an updated resource that could be mined. But if you don't have a place to send the ore to process it, you're years away from actually turning that ore into yellow cake and generating revenue for the company. That's a great overview of Tony. And I want to move on now and discuss your most recent acquisition, which is Virginia Energy. It's located in the state of Virginia. And Virginia is a pro-nuclear state. It has four nuclear reactors, which supply 14% of its electricity. Can you just provide us what the rationale was for acquiring this asset? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're very excited to have this project. This was a project that from the very early days of, of the consolidated uranium story was something that was on our radar screen. And why wouldn't it be? It's the largest undeveloped uranium project in the world at over 160 million pounds. That is globally significant in terms of size, ranks one of the top 10 ore bodies in the world. And so, so it was obviously on our radar screen. Why else was it on our radar screen? It's in the U.S., and then as you point, which is which is the largest consumer of, of uranium through its through its nuclear power fleet. And and it's in Virginia, a, a, a pro-nuclear state, as you point out, it has reactors and uh, and it has a new Republican governor who's very much bullish on nuclear energy and has gone all in. So we think this asset is a tremendous addition to our portfolio. As I highlighted at the beginning, it fits into that that long-term call option bucket. But certainly, we think it's a company maker on its own if we can uh, if we can advance it. So we've mentioned energy fuels a couple of times, but I, I did I neglected to make mention of the fact that they are your largest shareholder, and you have a strategic alliance with them. Can you just touch on the benefits of this alliance? Absolutely, and 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 when we made the acquisition of those projects, it was not simply sell us some assets and walk away. We really you know, joined together with Energy Fuels and became partners. And it manifests in, this, in a couple of different ways. So the first way, which we talked about, is the toll milling agreement. Again, this is a huge differentiator for a junior company like ourselves. No one else has access to this mill. There are no other mills that are operable. So that's huge. Secondly, um, you know, they're a big shareholder of us. In fact, they were also a shareholder of Virginia. So they, they maintain now, post that transaction, about a 16% interest in the company. And as part of being a big shareholder, they have some 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 rights, um, including including a, put, a equity participation, but also putting someone on the board. And so, as part of that transaction, Mark Chalmers, the CEO of Energy Fuels, came on our board. Mark is an invaluable resource. He's a mining engineer. He's been in the uranium space his entire career. He's been all over the world operating and building mines, and so it brings tremendous experience and credibility to our company. And then the third part of the uh, part of the agreement is an operating partnership where effectively we get access to the entire energy fuels team to second them to our projects as we need them. And so that's whether that's environmental, engineering, geology, mining, we get access to these experts, not only in those fields, but quite frankly, they're experts on these projects. We get to use them as we need them. And we, so we don't have to, to build up our, our own team when we can access, access those people. Of course, we do have our own guys as well, uh, but they're, uh, you know, it's very complimentary, very close working relationship, and uh, we couldn't have asked for a better partner. I want to move on now and discuss your finances. Given that you are focused on acquisitions and consolidation, your balance sheet is very important. So how much cash do you have? Yeah, so look, at our last financial statements to the end of September, we had about $20 million in working capital come down since then of course but we're still very well funded to to execute on this business plan 
and pursue some additional m a opportunities for the most part the the m a transactions that we've completed including virginia have been uh, we've issued shares for those transactions and i think that's going to continue to be the way that we do further acquisitions but having capital both to execute our programs on say for example tony m and in australia and argentina is important but also um, certainly uh, having additional cash is great for for M&A opportunities. It can it can it can sometimes be the difference maker, and it was, for example, in our Matouche acquisition. And I want to continue on with this discussion on M&A, given that's your primary strategy. How many deals? I'm curious how many deals you looked at in 2022, and how many of those deals did you turn down for whatever reason? Yeah, that's a long list, James. And if we were in my office, um, behind my wall, behind me on the wall, I have all the projects, uh, uranium projects in the world on a map. We, we're we're constantly evaluating projects, um, turning down projects. Yes, we definitely turned down projects last year that didn't fit into the portfolio. But sometimes, even when we turn projects down, it's it's not because it's not a project uh, specific thing or a company specific thing. It may just may, may not be the right time. And I think Virginia is a perfect example of that. We, our conversations, and, and this is all disclosed in, in, the, in the various documents around the transaction, those conversations started a couple of years ago, and then, then timing just became right um, for us to do the transaction uh, when we did. And when you're looking at acquisitions, are you looking at specific jurisdictions? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're gonna. I think you're gonna see the work that we do continues to focus on the jurisdictions that we're in, and it's a it's a it's a really important consideration. And I think it's being maybe overlooked by the investment community. You want to be in safe jurisdictions, stable jurisdictions. So Canada, Australia, or any, uh, Australia and the U.S. particularly for mining uh, are, are great jurisdictions. You you know what you own. Uh, in terms of in terms of the tenure of the projects, that's not the case around the world, and we're seeing some of that uh, play out in in other parts of the world, even right now, and particularly in the uranium space. You also want to be in so you want to be in stable countries, you want to be in mining friendly countries, you want to be in nuclear countries, you want to be in countries that have a history of uranium mining, and and all of the countries that we're in today check two, three, if not all four of those boxes, and so I think we're going to focus largely on on those jurisdictions going forward. And so that's a good point. You're going to continue on with this M&A strategy. You're still looking at assets. Oh, absolutely. And 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 so I think you know. And again, if you if you go back to our strategy about the buckets, we want to fill that that uh, that near term production bucket. So we'll look at assets on that front. There's also you know, and and so there'll be there are things that we're looking at that could be quite frankly transformational for the business. There's also smaller what we call tuck-in acquisitions. And if you look at what we did in Australia over the last year, we, we I think we acquired five projects and they were all in and around some of the existing things that we're doing, just bulking up that portfolio. And so I think you can see things on that side and I think you can see potentially transformational acquisitions as well. And then the third piece, and, and, you, and you may you, you, maybe you were gonna go there anyways, is we're also looking at how to, how to rationalize the portfolio and realize value. And we uh, we we did spin out a, a project in, into a new company last year, and there's other uh, there's other opportunities to potentially do that going forward. Yes, yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. So that company that you spun out was Labrador Uranium. You are now the interim CEO. Do you want to provide an update on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Labrador, as I said, was spun out of the of uh, CUR last year, but it was. It was in keeping with our kind of philosophy of creating a, creating more value out of the assets. It wasn't just our assets that we spun out. We we partnered up with Altius and Mega Uranium, who had projects in and around uh, our Moran Lake project in in Labrador, and 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 put together the largest land position in that camp. The first time that that camp is basically consolidated outside of uh, Paladin's Michelin project, we own virtually the entire the entire district. Uh, yes, I came in as as interim CEO in January, and uh, and and we're really you know we we had a we had a good drill program last year. We had some very encouraging results that we put out in into the into the market uh, recently, and uh, we're very busy working towards an active drill program this year. Work program. We've got over seven million dollars budgeted. We're going to go in and and follow up some of the success that we had last year 
look for targets further afield, and then do some do some very exciting work on the larger project area um, because it, it really hasn't been explored with modern techniques. Um, you know, Labrador has a great history of mining, has some phenomenal mines, but they were generally found by prospectors just finding outcrop. Work on, on understanding what's happening below the surface through modern geophysical techniques hasn't been done. We're going to fly a, a, a district-wide gravity survey uh, with radiometrics uh, early this year, and I think that's going to light up some very interesting targets for the company that we can pursue over the coming years. And when will that drilling program begin? So the season, it's a summer season there, so a couple of months away, but we're busy in the planning mode. And again, we'll have more updates uh, in terms of the specifics around that program in the coming months. But uh, the planning is, you know, we're, we're deep in the planning process uh, and pretty excited to get started there again. The winters are just too brutal to drill. Well, you can, but uh, but you have to put in a lot more infrastructure. It's, it's definitely more expensive. Um, so for, for now, we'll, we'll stick to summer drilling. We built a camp last year, easy access to the project from there. Um, and, and yeah, that's the game plan right now. Just, just keep it to the summer. Bill, as we wrap up, you and your team have completed 19 acquisitions since the formation of the company. You've grown the market cap from 2 million to over 150 million. What can investors look forward to in the coming months from Consolidated Uranium? Yeah, James, it's gonna be a very busy year again. Um, I think we're gonna, you're gonna look, look for activity from us on kind of two sides. So it's on the project side, went through what we're gonna do at Tony M. That's gonna get started in a couple of months. We're in fact, we're drilling at the Dineros project right now. So we'll, we'll get an update for the market on that, uh, that shortly. we we'll are also have work programs uh, planned both in Argentina and Australia. And then on the other side, watch for us to continue to be busy on the M&A front, detailed some of the things that we're working on strategically. And I think there'll be a number of very interesting, uh, in, interesting uh, acquisitions or, or M&A things that, that the company undertakes. Bill, that was a great update and congratulations on your latest acquisition, Virginia Energy. And we look forward to future updates. Once again, thank you. Yeah, thank you, James. Great to talk to you. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Did you know that 80% of our viewers are not subscribers to our channel? So that probably means you. So be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hi, David. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Toronto? Well, Jimmy, we're doing great in Toronto. Beautiful day today and uh, some signs that spring is coming. Ah, finally. David, 2022 was a year of many milestones at Denison, all of which were resulted in de-risking at the Wheeler River project. And the primary achievement was the ISR field testing at Phoenix, which involved injecting the mining solution into the formation and extracting a uranium bearing solution. And most investors will have no idea of the details which are required to perform such a test. Maybe you can just take us through a brief description of what that entails and also what the results were. Well, Jimmy, my pleasure. Look, I mean, the headline here is that the results were excellent. Uh, this was a huge test for our company and the future of our company. Uh, but but to dive into it, um, really, we have to go back in time uh, quite, a, quite a ways because this test, we call it the uh, feasibility field test. And it's essentially a small pilot operation uh, supporting our feasibility study. And of course, the test was in the field. So, so you guys get the name now. But um, really, this test, to be prepared for this test, it took years of systematic 
de-risking in the lab and in the field to collect information both on metallurgy as well as on flow rates and, and uh, our ability to pump and inject solution into the ore body. And all of that information is as simple as I'm making it sound now, um, was accumulated through the end of 2021. And at that point, we were in a position to design this feasibility field test and actually take it through the permitting and regulatory process. And so that was really the beginning of 2022 on the FFT was actually getting this test permitted. Now, what this test involved was us taking a part of a commercial scale test pattern that we installed in 2021 and using it to inject a live mining solution. So an, uh, an acidic mining solution, similar to what we'll use in, in production to actually go in there and uh, dissolve uranium in the, in the deposit right at the heart of our Phoenix deposit and recover our uranium bearing solution. Now, of course, when you hear that, uh, and we talk about this being a feasibility field test and, and similar to a small pilot, you, you have to first work at getting permission to do this. This isn't the kind of test that we could just do uh, as if it was an exploration program. And so we did go and uh, work with both our federal and our provincial regulators. So the Ministry of the Environment in Saskatchewan and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission uh, federally. And this was a first for, for both regulators. Uh, nobody has, has done this kind of test in the Athabasca Basin for uranium mining. And so the, the real first milestone in all of the work that we put in for 2022 was getting permission from our regulators to do the test. And we were really successful in doing that. Uh, not only did we get uh, approvals from both regulators, but we got them roughly on time with our project plans so that we were able to then carry out the rest of the process, which of course for this facility meant we had to go procure materials uh, to actually set up the surface facilities necessary for this. And then we had to actually carry out the construction and the commissioning of these facilities. All of that in an environment where the supply chain was still actually quite under stress uh, through the tail end of, of the pandemic. And uh, all of it went very well with us commissioning the facility for the leaching phase of the test in the late summer and us uh, commencing and completing both the leaching phase and the neutralization phase in the third and the fourth quarter of May 2. As I said at the start, not to bury the, the headline, the results were excellent. Uh, we were able to uh, prove up or either at, at expected levels or exceeding levels for all of our key operating parameters that we were looking to demonstrate with this test. So th those are things like flow rates, uh, the time that it would take to acidify parts of the well field before we would start to get to a, a, a rate of um, acidification where we could effectively recover uranium and ultimately um, uranium recovery. You know, the, the, the back end of this test and the headline was that we recovered over 14,000 pounds U308 uh, in solution from the operation of this uh, small part of the test pattern of only, uh, for only 10 days after we achieved uh, our target acidification. So, that was really a, a, a historic accomplishment. I mean, the first pounds that have been recovered from ISR mining in the history of the Athabasca Basin, uh, done by Denison, and uh, highly successful when it comes to uh, being able to actually uh, prove up our parameters. And, and that, that was really leaching. Uh, the next phase, a little less glamorous, but equally important from a regulatory standpoint, was neutralization. And that process also went very well. Uh, we were able to carry out our neutralization phase in accordance with our plans and return uh, the ore body into an environmentally acceptable level from a pH standpoint in a relatively quick period of time. And those two phases were, were critical to collecting information that'll feed into our feasibility study. At that point, uh, we did stop field activities and um, we've paused for winter with uh, you know, a, a volume of stored solution on surface and uh, cold up in the Athabasca Basin. So, so most of that is frozen. And we'll resume the final phase of the test, which is our recovered solution management phase. And this is really a compliance phase. We're gonna resume that in the spring. So no, no critical information coming out of this phase, but a phase necessary under our permits to basically uh, proceed to reduce the amount of solution we're storing on site 
and start the uh, process of reclaiming the facility after the test. But all in all, uh, really an excellent, excellent outcome for us in the field, uh, proving up all the metallurgical work we've done in the lab with all of the pump and injection testing to tangibly demonstrate that ISR mining works at Phoenix and can work in the Athabasca Basin. Like I said, I knew there was a lot of detail involved and I'm glad you gave such a detailed explanation. Thanks for that. And David, now that you've proven to shareholders, stakeholders, and also regulators that ISR works in the basin, will you focus on using this technique on other projects? Well, Jimmy, yeah, we um, we do think that the application of ISR mining is in the Athabasca Basin goes far beyond Phoenix. And uh, we are focused on looking at deposits that we already control or have an interest in to bring ISR mining there. And uh, we started in, in 2020 with uh, what I'll call sort of a proof of concept uh, PEA study on the Waterbury Lake property to assess whether uh, a smaller sized Athabasca deposit could be economical uh, if extracted using ISR mining. And, and the results of that PEA were very positive. And so, you know, that is a project that uh, quite reasonably we'll be looking to revisit now that we've done some more de-risking at Phoenix. But also, uh, and something we're pretty excited about, is the potential to use ISR at a project that we have uh, joint ownership with uh, Arano. Uh, this is the Midwest joint venture. So we're the minority partner there. We have a 25% interest. But during 2022, uh, we worked uh, with and for the joint venture to actually carry out some internal scoping studies assessing the application or potential application of ISR at Midwest. So that's something that um, we're, we're pretty excited about. Certainly have more work to do with our partner there before we can comment more on that. But it gives you a good sense that we are really turning to the other deposits in the region because the success we've had at Phoenix is, is really giving us confidence that this mining method uh, can work in, in the, in, for certain deposits in the right geologic setting. And David, another milestone was the metallurgy and recovery rates. What were the recovery rates and how is this significant? Yeah, Jimmy, so we've talked about the feasibility field test. Uh, that was a big accomplishment for the year, uh, but almost equally important is some of the long-term uh, leach, core leach testing that we were doing um, for uh, with ore samples that we recovered from Phoenix. And these are in situ recovery specific leach tests. And uh, we put out news in December uh, talking about a test that we had run for over a year. So an intact piece of core recovered from the ore body that we ran in a specialized piece of equipment that only uh, allows the leaching to occur by moving through the natural permeability of that core. So no crushing, grinding, no agitation. This is as it would leach in the ground. We, we ran this core sample for over a year and we, we achieved over 97% recovery. And almost equally important here is that we had an average uranium bearing solution head grade from that year long test of over 18 grams a liter uranium, which was very important because it supports our, our feasibility study where we're using an assumed 15 grams a liter uranium head grade, which was a 50% increase from our pre-feasibility study. So that test, really help to demonstrate that when we make contact with the uh, ore body, with our leach solution, we can achieve some very high rates of recovery. Now, it's not to say that we'll run a 97% rate of recovery in our feasibility study, but it definitely gives us great confidence that we can achieve the industry standard recovery rates necessary for the project to be economic. Now that all uh, layered on to other testing we've done in the year of metallurgy around the plant. And I just want to tack that on, if you if if you will. But um, you know, a lot of our work has also been on designing our processing plant, and so we've taken uh, gone through a whole bunch of bench scale tests on our processing plant. And important, another important metallurgical milestone in the year was that we were able to prove up our process to produce an in spec industry standard yellow cake from uranium bearing solutions recovered from our cores at Phoenix, and we did that. Uh, using a simplified direct precipitation method, um, which is important because that's how we modeled it in our PFS, but also we did it without needing to use calcination. 
which is an important detail from a cost standpoint. Uh, we are not and have not been designing our plant to include a calciner, and we were able to achieve that inspect product without having to go to calcination. We've spent a lot of time about what's happening at Phoenix and the success that you've had there. Give us an update on what's happening at Griffin. Well, look, Griffin is, uh, you know, part of the story. It's an important part of the story at Wheeler River. Um, we've, we are also updating uh, the technical report for Wheeler River for Griffin. And so, uh, you know, when we look into 2023, the feasibility study for Phoenix, as, as well as an update to the pre-feasibility study for Griffin, those are both important uh, milestones in 2023. And with Griffin, uh, look, it has not been our focus. Uh, we are we are focused on on Phoenix, and we've got a um, we've had a, a project plan from the PFS that showed a staged development plan, with Griffin coming uh, as a as a staggered development um, decision to Phoenix. But um, we're actually quite uh, excited about the whole update to the to the to the technical report, including on Griffin, because now we get to recast things with current costs. You know, we've seen uh, inflation uh, affect a number of mining projects. And we know that our technical report was uh, last issued in 2018. And so Griffin will be an important part uh, of the narrative for us to update those costs, but still remains an important part of our project, of our company, when it comes to the long-term viability of our company and the ability for Phoenix to generate cash flows that we can redeploy into a growth asset Griffin and produce pounds uh, for, you know, longer than that Phoenix mine life and into a uranium market that really needs the pounds beyond 2030, which is where you'd see Griffin uh, slot in in terms of a development timeline. David, another element central to de-risking is moving forward the permitting process. You submitted the draft EIS for the Wheeler River project in Q4 of 2022. Let's discuss the timeline associated with this. Yeah, Jimmy, well, since uh, submission of the draft EIS, um, you know, our work has been focused on preparing for the public comment period. So that's the first uh, sort of phase that followed uh, the conformity review, which we passed, uh, meant that we had submitted all the necessary elements to be considered by our federal regulators in the province. And so we uh, were waiting for responses from the public comment period, and that'll really start the process of back and forth on uh, review and comment and changes or updates to the draft EIS as we work towards getting a final EIS, EIS that's ready for regulatory approval. Now that process uh, we expect uh, will take time um, and so we are handicapping that this is a two to three year type process if we go back to the submission of the draft EIS before we're in place to have an approved uh, final EIS that's gone through the CNSC. David, another asset in your portfolio, which I would like to discuss is the Waterbury Lake project, which is not as advanced as Wheeler River, but it also has ISR potential. Can you just take us through this project and the progression that you and your team have been making there? Yeah, Waterbury is a really interesting case. Um, this is a project we, we own about two thirds and uh, our co-owner is the Korean uh, nuclear power company, KHNP, this is part of KEPCO and they operate all of the uh, nuclear power plants in Korea. Uh, you know, we, we looked at this project in, in 2020 uh, at a PEA level for ISR mining. And in some ways, I found it to be um, more impactful than what we had done with Phoenix in that the project itself is, is smaller than and, and lower grade than Phoenix. And so you're talking in the range of 10 to 12 million pounds at 2% for the, uh, THT deposit at Waterbury Lake. Now it's sandstone hosted, and so that's the part that makes it amenable to ISR mining. And we really wanted to test, can the breakthrough on ISR mining turn a deposit like this into something that's economically viable? And the results from that PEA suggested that the mining method can do that. And then now we've got a project that doesn't look that different from some of the US ISR projects in terms of scale. So again, we're, we're, we're forecasting more like 10 million pounds of production over six years. That's similar to what you'd see out of some of the larger US ISR assets. Uh, cost profile coming out under $30 US per pound, which makes it very competitive globally. Uh, of course, we wish we had more pounds there, but it's the kind of project that really 
does compare well against the smaller scale assets in the US. Uh, CapEx in the range of $100, $120 million Canadian. All of these things sound very familiar to those US ISR assets, but they're in the Athab but it's in the Athabasca Basin. So we're, we're excited about where that could go, given the de-risking we've achieved at Phoenix. It certainly makes sense that we would go back and revisit uh, the, the project plan for, for THT as an ISR project uh, for the next several years. And uh, it's something that we're excited to, to turn to. So you mentioned that you would like to have more pounds at Waterbury, and that's a good segue into my next question, which is exploration. Do you have any plans to do any further exploration at Waterbury? Well, Jimmy, exploration, uh, not, maybe not so much at Waterbury in, in 2023, but exploration is still a key part of our DNA. And um, I would say that we're actually a bit of a sleeper story on, on exploration. I mean, rightly, we focus on, on Phoenix, the ISR de-risking, uh, the Griffin Deposit, Wheeler River, and, and Waterbury, and McLean Lake, and all of those core assets that we've got. But um, we actually spend a, a pretty liberal amount on exploration in 2022, and, and our plans for 2023 will probably look similar. And so we are focused on primarily searching for ISR amenable deposits. And now that's not uh, quite swung back to um, in favor in the region. Most people are still uh, looking for basement hosted deposits. But uh, we have great confidence with what we've done with ISR that our exploration focus has been has swung to ISR amenable deposits for the last several years. And so our budgets, when you sort of stack it up against the, the juniors in the space, we probably have one of the largest exploration budgets in the region. We just don't talk about it that much. We don't put out every drill result. Uh, we've got mineralization that we're drilling that we don't. We don't often put out a news release because for us, the threshold of that is, is bigger. We need to have something that we believe we can turn into an ISR deposit before we get too excited about it. But yes, we, we do have uh, a continued focus on finding additional ISR amenable deposits uh, in the region, absolutely. It will be interesting to see if other operators also try out ISR mining techniques given the success that you've had. Well, yeah, look, at Jimmy, I think I think in, in the fullness of time, um, we will absolutely see that. And we, we already have that trend a little bit opening up with our Midwest project with Arano, where we're doing that concept study um, together with the joint venture to assess it. But, but in fairness, I mean, um, the confidence level on the ISR mining is not universal across the basin. Um, we've spent uh, thousands of, of hours and um, millions and millions of dollars over the last several years carrying out this de-risking. And really only our team has the knowledge that's come out of that. And only our team has the confidence that's come out of that because we've seen the results tangibly from our test work. And so I think it's, it's actually a bit of a competitive advantage right now that our confidence and our knowledge around what it takes to be able to actually develop an ISR amenable deposit in the region puts us in a position where we really are leading the world for ISR in the Athabasca Basin. And our ability to assess projects is far advanced over anyone else in, in, in the industry. And so I'm, I'm optimistic in the fullness of time, everyone gets there, but I'm also um, really encouraged that there's, there is some hesitancy still and it's creating a big business opportunity for us. David, let's move on now and discuss your balance sheet. Maybe you can tell us how much cash you have and how you will allocate that cash in the coming year. Yeah, Jimmy, look, we're um, we're really well capitalized. Um, we've we've got working capital investments over two hundred twenty-four million dollars Canadian at the end of the third quarter. Now, of course, we're 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 approaching our year-end reporting, so everyone will get a fresh view of our balance sheet uh, when our year-end financials and MD&A come out. A uh, healthy cash position, and of course, a, a large holding of physical uranium, two and a half million pounds of physical uranium on the balance sheet. So we do have a, an ATM that uh, is up on our base shelf prospectus that we use uh, selectively, but really have all the tools we need in the toolkit to stay well capitalized and avoid any sort of uh, significant, um, you know, major dilution event in the near term. David, Cameco came out with a massive quarter, adding an additional 80 million pounds in long-term contracts. 
which in included a contract with Ukraine. And I'm curious to hear your views on this and where you think the term market is going. Yeah, Jimmy, those those results and particularly the announcement around long-term contracting from Cameco is incredibly bullish for our for our sector. Um, look, I'm 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 really optimistic around the way Cameco is managing the market. Uh, they they continue to apply a level of um, production restraint, while at the same time shoring up their long-term business through contracting. And I, th I think it's quite reasonable that we've seen a bit of a plateau in in pricing because Cameco is making and others are making a fair amount of supply available at these levels. But I think what's so bullish about it, and, and maybe it is really driven by that Ukraine announcement is to think, you know, here's one contract with one customer that has a total of as much as 67 million pounds U308. Well, let's put that into context. That's that's more than we're projecting for, for production from the entire Phoenix deposit. Now we've been working for years to advance that and it's a core to our business, but in one contract with one utility, that many pounds has been spoken for with Cameco. Now, there's a lot more of that to come, and it really does drive home that once Cameco has shored up that baseline in their contract portfolio, they have the ability now to be more selective. And I think that's the window I see, uh, I'm looking through in terms of what will happen with price going forward, is as Cameco be, is, is more selective with their contracting, we have the potential to see the term price, spot price, re-rate upwards. And then it really drives, well, where are the other projects coming from? And what are their cost profiles? Because if you need all of Phoenix and you still don't meet that one contract demand from Ukraine, well, what about the next project? And what's their cost profile look like? And what, what is the real incentive price? Now we're getting into some really meaty supply demand discussions that'll be driven by the cost profile of the projects rather than where we've been over the last several years, which was price discovery driven on inventories. So I think it's, it, it, you know, there's really a lot of good reason to be excited about what we're hearing from Cameco and around the uranium market. David, as we wrap up, we started this conversation by what you accomplished in 2022. Can you summarize for investors what they can expect in 2023? Yeah, Jimmy, the the key in 23, uh, if we want to say that, is the uh, is the feasibility study for Wheeler River for Phoenix and the update to the PFS for Griffin. So uh, that is that is critical for us. Our team is hustling, working on that right now. Uh, we are still on track for completion through the first half of 2023. Uh, look, this this study gives us a, a current view of the project in the current market. We're talking the uranium market, we're talking the supply chain, all of that so we can reflect uh, the current cost of this project and make informed decisions about moving forward. From there, it's uh, you know accelerating with detailed design and engineering and that permitting process moving in parallel so that when we are through that EIS and permitting process, we are positioned to make a development decision and get those pounds on their way to coming out of the ground. So it all starts with the feasibility study in 23, and uh, you, you'll see that our team is really focused on that. I think you pepper in uh, some other positive news and developments around exploration and other projects that we might be looking to advance with ISR, and all together makes just for another really exciting year for our company. Well, David, that was a great update on Dennis and Mines, and we look forward to the pending feasibility study on Wheeler River. Once again, thank you. Thanks very much, Jimmy.
Hi, Elisa. Thank you very much for joining us today. I always enjoy speaking with you and hearing your views on the resource sector. But before we begin our discussion on uranium, why don't you just provide us with a brief overview of your firm, Copernic? Where's the firm based? What is the firm's mandate and also the firm's AUM? Absolutely. Thank you, Jimmy, for, for having me. It's it's a pleasure to be back. Um, Copernic, we, we founded in July of 2013. So our, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary. We are located in Tampa, Florida. And even though we're 10 years old, our process and philosophy is much older than that. Our, our CIO and founder, Dave Iben, has been in the investment world for 40 years. So he's been fine tuning this, this process and philosophy for, for many decades. Our philosophy is we're, we're global value managers. We're, we're fundamental and bottom up. Um, and philosophically, we, we view ourselves as owners of businesses. So every day our job is to, to go out and appraise the value of businesses, understand what we're owning, why we own it, what are the risks, and then, when the, and then we wait, and we wait for the market to, to give us a price that is much different than our value. Um, that is easier you know, to say than actually do. So you need a, a process and a discipline process to, to take you through and, and keep you disciplined. So that is basically what we, we do um, you know, as, as our, our mandate. We're, we're global. We don't want to limit ourselves in any way. We don't have any market cap constraints. So we want to be as, as nimble as we possibly can be. We're managing six billion dollars right now, and you know, the size is something that we consider uh, very important. We want to maintain that cap capacity constraint. So we see ourselves as eventually getting to, to 20 billion. That's that's the max that we've told our clients. We have all of our money in, invested in these funds too. So we want to make sure that we stay nimble and we can create create that alpha. And Copernic is also a large investor in resources. Can you just provide us with an overview of what sectors you are currently invested in and what would be the allocation toward those sectors? Absolutely. And and we are invested in resources because that is where the value is. So you know, there, that won't always be the case. Um, but currently, the value we see is really in emerging markets and then in these resource companies. Our highest conviction area are, is in the, the gold mining sector. So 25% of our, our global all cap fund is invested in the, the gold mining companies. We also have a significant portion in energy. We have 13% in, in energy. That is, some of that is uranium, some of that is US natural gas. Um, and finally, other resources we have, you know, we have agriculture um, and, and you mentioned uranium, we certainly own quite a bit of, of uranium in our fund as well. And so given this is a uranium conference, I want to focus on that. And why don't you just share with us what your investment thesis is? Why are you long uranium? Uranium is has amazing supply, supply and demand fundamentals. The, the demand has outstripped mine supply for, for many, many years. And so the, the difference has been made up with, with inventory, secondary supplies that won't be able to go on forever. So right now the, the uranium price is trading below its incentive price, and that's the long-term price that, that balances supply and demand. So if, if the price is below that price, then you won't see new mines being built. It's not high enough to incentivize mining companies to, to take on the risk of of building a new, bringing on new supply. So when the prices get below this, you know, it's just a matter of time before, assuming that the, the product is in demand, it's just a matter of time before that, that price reaches that incentive price. So um, we're, we own both physical uranium, uh, we also own the, the mining companies. We own Cameco, Kazatom Prom, and some of the, the junior mining companies as well. So that's why we, we like it. The, the supply hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and then demand is, is robust and also the, the rhetoric is improving. 
with the invasion into Ukraine, suddenly countries are starting to think about where is our, our energy coming from. And countries in the developed world that were not as positive on nuclear power are now coming around and they're extending the life of, of their existing power plants. You're seeing Japan restart some of their power plants. Germany even is is becoming is coming around to nuclear power. So the demand side seems to be very good. The supply side, you know, eventually the the release valve is is the uranium price. And the spot price is around fifty dollars a pound, give or take. What is your incentive price? It's a it's a tough thing to say. <laughs> There's no certainty with this, but. What you can say right now is that we are not seeing any new mines coming on at 50. So it's definitely higher than 50. We estimate it somewhere between 75, 100. Now, this was also before they printed a lot of money. Um, now, with all the, the monetary the monetary base going up, you have a lot of uh, cost pressure also. So that will drive up the cost curve. And so, how much of the, the new money flows into uh, the incentive price of uranium? You know, how much is, is uranium worth? You could make an, a case that it's uh, the incentive price is actually closer to 125. So we're looking at a number of different scenarios when we're, we're valuing these companies. Um, and even 125 is not, <laughs> not close to what it, it got to in the, the previous cycle. It was a high of 137. Um, that was clearly a high enough incentive price. I mean, Kazakhstan brought on 10x the supply when in the last cycle. So um, we like it that the uranium price is, is well below that. Um, but where exactly that incentive price is, you know, it, it's never so certain. And you mentioned that you're along a couple of producers. Will you also invest in developers and explore co's? We will invest in any company, assuming that there's good risk adjusted upside, that has a resource. So the way that we value these uranium companies is, is an EV per pound of resource. So we say Cameco, you have a certain number of pounds. You know, here's what we think the uranium is worth. And here's how much we think that you'll make on that uranium. And let's subtract out all the liabilities that you you have, plus any capex that you're going to need to spend. That's what our value is um, for uh, for someone like for someone like Chemico. So production figures don't they don't factor into our valuation. So then you can apply that same methodology to a developer, a company that is not that's not producing, that's just sitting on a deposit. Um, a company that doesn't have anything, we would basically give that a, a zero value. Now, where we see the biggest disconnect in the market is this difference between how most in the industry value mining companies, they use a, a cash flow model, and you know how they are valuing developing companies. And it gets back to really what is value. Many say the value is the sum of all the discounted cash flows. We flip that around and we say, well, if something has value, then you will it, it will drive cash flows eventually. Um, so what makes something valuable is that it is in demand and it's scarce. So these deposits that aren't producing, so they're not showing any cash flow, they're still very valuable. Yet, especially in the, in the gold mining sector, um, these deposits are basically, basically giving no value. And it was the case in the, the uranium sector in 2020. Many of these junior companies went up 10 times in between you know, early 2020 and 2021. And that's really the leverage that you can see when you, when you own these developers. And that's what that's the leverage we see in the gold mining today. But today, the, the uranium companies are still there's still some good upside, but not nearly the the, the kind that we saw uh, several years ago. And do you have market cap constraints or jurisdiction constraints? 
No, as, as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that we can stay nimble and we keep our opportunity set as, as large as possible. So we don't have any market cap constraints. However, we limit ourselves to 20% of the free flow or 10% of the shares outstanding. So the smaller companies will have smaller positions in our portfolio. And you mentioned that one of the names you're invested in is Kazataprom, and that's in the country of Kazakhstan. Some people might shy, shy away from that country, but not Kopernik. <laughs> well, shy away. I, it's some, we like it when when people say uninvestable. <laughs> shy away, you know, there, there's plenty of risk in, in Kazakhstan. And so we do require a larger risk adjustment factor to, when we invest in, in Kazakhstan. So the way that we do it is we have um, specific company margin of safety. So not all companies should deserve a 30% a margin of safety, for example. If you're investing in, in Cameco, they'll have a, a smaller margin of safety than when we invest in, in Kazakhstan. So that's how we adjust for taking on that additional risk. When the market is where it is today, where things outside of developed markets are trading at much cheaper prices, you know, we, we take that in consideration. We say, okay, it deserves more of a discount, but maybe not 100%, which is what the, the market sometimes can do. And I want to continue this discussion toward Cameco. In late 2022, Cameco, along with Brookfield, acquired Westinghouse Electric, one of the world's largest nuclear services businesses. I was surprised to see them not acquire an explorer co or a de developer just to build up their res resources or reserves. What are your thoughts on this acquisition? Well, <laughs> the mining companies, um, you know, we've been, we've been investing in mining companies for a very long time and we can see the type of destruction that, that can happen with, with poor capital allocation. This is not that, I mean, this was a probably a fair price. However, they they used shares, which we think the uranium price is too low. So when Cameco issues shares, they're effectively selling uranium for $50 a pound. We would prefer that they didn't do that. And also we would prefer that they invest in some of the the really good deals in you know the, the junior mining companies that are trading for huge discounts to, to their shares. Um, we've been talking with Cameco for many, many years, and we were always trying to encourage them to, to buy some of these companies like NextGen or Fission um, that are sitting on these massive deposits, not getting the value that they, they should have. Um, wouldn't it have been nice if, if Cameco had bought NextGen for, for $2 a share? <laughs> Um, so I guess not maybe surprising because they're going into a different lane, frustrating because had they used that billion dollars to invest in a, a de developer years ago, they could have gotten many more uranium pounds. And you raise a very good point. So because they did issue shares, they're effectively selling uranium at 50 bucks a pound, but in your mind, your incentive price is 75 or 100 bucks, so you think they're giving away uranium at a far exactly for half off. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting viewpoint. Interesting. Now, I they also recently uh, came up with their Q4 numbers within that press release. They also made mention of the fact that they've entered into a number of long-term contracting agreements. Are your views similar to when when a company like Cameco enters into these? contracting agreements, are they also giving away uranium at a too low of a price? Exactly. I mean, the, when they are entering into these long-term contracts, you know, the, the, the contract terms are opaque. They won't, they won't disclose any information on them. However, when they're, so the long-term contracts show two things. One, that the utilities are starting to come back into the space, which that's a good thing. They've, the utilities have been surprisingly complacent for for many years so that's that's a good sign for the industry however for cameco when they're signing long-term contracts at 50 dollars a pound what kind of price escalators are they putting in there we we don't know so 
we'd obviously prefer that they sign these long-term contracts when the price is closer to the incentive price. Elisa, as we wrap up, 2022 is a brutal year for global markets, including investors who are in the uranium space. We have seen a bit of a move here in the last few months in, in both the spot price and also a number of the equities. But what would you say to these investors who might be somewhat frustrated with this trade? Well, I can say that uh, for many years, this this trade has frustrated us. We, we've been invested in the uranium mining and physical uranium sector for since inception um our inception so that's been almost 10 years what we often tell our clients when we're talking about well something could double or triple but you just don't know when that's that's a hard that's hard for many investors because they want to know when they're going to be to be paid but we look at it a different way and we say okay you your choices are you can own a bond for three to four percent and get that negative real yield or you could buy uranium which could double you just don't know when and so even if it takes 10 years to double you're still making seven percent a year um, if you annualize that so the return on patients can be very significant for long-term investors um, also investors that that don't see volatility as risk because these mining companies can be very volatile, and so you can take advantage of when they when they drop and, and add more and, and trim as they go up. So we've we've shown in some of our quarterly calls that even if a, a company is is flat but volatile, you can make some very good returns. And then trimming around that volatility with companies that that do very well, you you enhance those returns. So patience is important. Uh, understanding that volatility is, is part of the, the mining sector, uh, is part of investing, frankly, and that embracing that as a, as a good thing and as, vol as opportunity um, is, is advice that we would give to, to our clients. Well, Lisa, that was a great discussion, and I want to thank you for making time with us today and sharing your insights on your investment methodology. And given that 25% of your portfolio is invested in gold, I hope you can join us for our upcoming gold conference in the next few months. Would love that. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Hi, Ross. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in California? It's great. I mean, great to be here with you today. Um, it's nice and sunny in, in California, so no complaints on that side. Ross, Fission recently released a feasibility study on the PL PLS project, and I want to go through this, but before we do that, I want to provide a visual on where Fission Uranium is in the Athabasca Basin. Where is it in relation to Next Gen or Cameco? Sure. Well, the Athabasca Basin itself takes up almost the, the full uh, northern third of the province of Saskatchewan. Um, we're on the west side, so we're really not very far from the Alberta border. Um, but uh, and then, say, in relationship to next gen, the Aero deposit is about three kilometers uh, away from the Triple R deposit. So they're really, really close by. They're on the same major corridor that. Um, you know, it's, it's fault zones and, you know, the same geologic corridor uh, that hosts both deposits. With respect to Cameco, I mean, they have ground around the Athabasca Basin, but their uh, primary focus has been in the eastern side of the basin, which is, I guess, as the crow flies around 200 kilometers to the east 
um, where our uh, operation is and next gen's property as well. Let's move on now and discuss the recently released feasibility study in the, and I want to look at the economics behind the project. Why don't right. we just start with how many pounds are in the ground and, and what is the grade? As an overall global resource, we're looking at a hundred, little more than 130 million pounds U308 overall. Um, in the mine plan itself, uh, we're really using um, about a hundred million pounds in the in the resource, which equates to 93, almost 94 million pounds in the reserve. And let's look at the highlights. Why don't we just touch on the net present value, the internal rate of return, and also the payback? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a number of great highlights in the a feasibility study, the, the net present value of NPV using an 8% discount after tax, we're looking at $1.2 billion Canadian, so very healthy. And IRR after tax, uh, just over 27%, so again, very robust, really healthy. You know, some other highlights that, that I think are, are notable from the feasibility study, we're looking at a 10-year mine life now in the pre-feasibility we were seven years uh now we're 10 so i, I think that that's was certainly a number that we were wanting to uh, achieve in the feasibility and in fact we, we did do that so I, I think maybe the other point i would make sure that people understood is this uh feasibility study has really demonstrated that the uh, triple r deposit promises to be one of the lowest cost cash cost operators out there. We're looking at sub $10 a pound, U308 US dollars, um, which is around $13 a pound Canadian. The PLS project is consisted of five zones. Are all five zones within that feasibility study? Yeah, right. So the, the, the triple R deposit, there's five zones. I usually uh, look at them like pearls on a necklace. You know, they they, there's around 200 meters, two to 300 meters that separate them from each other, but they're all along the same linear trend. Um, the feasibility study consists of three of those five zones. So the three in the middle, uh, the 840 West, the 00 and the R780 East. Um, they're the ones that make up the, uh, the, the mine plan in the feasibility study. So there's still yet the, uh, the two zones that flank on either side. Um, they can be part of the mine plan, we feel. I mean, they similar grade to the other zones. There's just not enough drill holes in there to um, be able to include them in, uh, in the economic study. But, you know, more drilling in the future uh, will be able to convert those over, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So lots of room for upside. Great deal of upside on the project. It's, uh, you know, I mean, just speaking of the upside, we could, from what we know and have already delineated, there's growth there. All zones are, are still open at depth and, and a long plunge. In fact, we're learning quite a bit about it. Um, the drilling we did on the R840 West zone in 2021, not only converted that zone from inferred to indicated, which allowed us to use it in the, in the mine plan, but it really demonstrated that the zone is uh, a lot better than what we thought it was going to be. It, it looks to be open open at depth, we have higher grade mineralization, not in the mine plan, down uh, below at depth. And, you know, uh, it, it, it's, to me, it, it basically shows that there's a, a great deal of growth potential in that zone. And another very interesting geological feature associated with PLS is that it's very shallow. And maybe you can just speak to this and tell us how shallow it is and how does it compare with what we might find in the Eastern end of the basin? like on Cigar Lake or MacArthur, and what will this do to cost and economics? Yeah, it, it is extremely shallow. I mean, the, the top of the mineralization starts at 55 meters below the surface. The real deposit, uh, I would say, is from 55 meters to around 300 meter depth. That's really the, the bulk of the, of the zone. Um, you know, compared to say deposits on the eastern side that you're referring to, the ones that are currently in uh, in production, you're looking at Cigar Lake, which is around 400 meters depth. You're looking at MacArthur River, which is closer to 600 meters below the surface. 
but they're totally different types of deposits too. They're all high grade uranium, but Cigar and MacArthur River are what you call unconformity deposits. So they're within the Athabasca Basin itself and right at the interface of the sandstone and the basement rock below. Ours is not only shallow, but it's also 100% in basement rock without any Athabasca sandstone cover on top. What that gives us is much more competent rock to work with so uh, you don't have the water issues that you tend to have in the, in the associated with sandstone. So you've got, I'd say, lower technical risk just by being in a basement rock host to begin with. Being near surface really, uh, you know, de-risks a lot of it, or de-risks the cost, but also the, you know, the technical hurdles that's involved in mining as well. So it's, uh, you know, it wins on a, on a number of fronts. And Ross, you mentioned earlier that there is lots of room for upside. And even though the feasibility study has been complete, will you still explore? Oh, uh, for sure. I mean, to grow this resource? For sure. We're, we're going, we've got a great deal of, of room to grow, as, as I mentioned, on the deposit itself and around the deposit. The whole Patterson Lake corridor is several kilometers long. Um, and, you know, if, just forgetting about property boundaries uh, a little bit. If you just look at the frequency of, of occurrences along the trend, you know, you have so far on the south, south uh, west side, we have the triple R deposit, three kilometers away, you've got the uh, next gen zero deposit, three kilometers uh, northeast of that, you have the Spitfire zone. It's just, you're starting to see a number of uh, deposits occurrence, a, a, you know, a sense of frequency. And we can still go the other way, of which you know on, on that on that corridor, which is 100% on on fission ground, I think, and that's very prospective for finding new mineralization uh, occurrences. But also, there's a this is a very large land package, the uh, PLS. It's 31,000 hectares. We really only explored systematically between five five to 10 percent of it. Um, we think that there's a, a great deal of exploration upside on, on the rest of the ground. And uh, we'll probably start, uh, you know, doing a more concerted effort on, on the exploration front, possibly in the latter part of 2023, certainly, you know, in, in the years coming ahead, you know, with the improved drain markets, I think it, it totally justifies us, uh, you know, having a, an, a, an exploration approach as well. And Ross, you mentioned that, the Spitfire zone is close. I'm not familiar with this zone. Who owns that? So this is on a, um, the property is a joint venture with Orano, Cameco, and Purepoint Uranium. So uh, again, it's on the same, same trend. It's on the same corridor that hosts the Triple R and the Aero deposit. They have had some encouraging grill results there, high grade uh, results. Um, I'm not sure there's been a whole lot of drilling as of late on it, but it really does speak to the, you know, just the potential for for higher grade mineralization along this uh, along this trend. So, you know, in my mind, I'd like looking at the overall western side of the basin, and I just see this. There's almost no question that the the quality of the discoveries and advance and development. Um, tells us that the western side of the province is going to be the next uh, the next generation of mines in the Athabasca Basin. So you, currently everything's on the eastern side. It will start shifting over to the western side in the uh, you know the latter part of this decade and certainly by the next uh, 2030s. And Ross, now that the feasibility study is complete, what are the next steps for Vision Uranium? A lot of the the uh, the next steps for us. Um, are focusing on the permitting and regulatory front, um, you know, which is basically all about getting uh, getting the project ready to be licensed to build and operate. Um, we'll be uh, entering formally into the environmental impact uh, study towards the end of this year, towards the end of uh, 2023. Um, that's one part of the. Uh, you know the activity a lot a large deal of our focus permitting and regulatory but the other uh, equally important part is securing relationships with our indigenous rights holders and our various local stakeholders in the area yeah, i think having 
the, the support of the people that live in the area in which we're operating is absolutely critical and vital towards getting uh, all the approvals necessary support for this project to turn into a uh, mining operation. And so we do put a lot of effort into building th these relationships. We already have, uh, you know, all the key capacity and funding agreements in place with uh, all of our uh, key uh, indigenous rights holders in the area. And we're just, we're using these as foundational agreements in which to continue to build, um, you know, uh, agreements and respect and you know long-term working relationship with 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 all the people in, in the in the northern part where we operate and i'm sorry what is the timeline associated with the environmental impact statement right so we begin as i said formally towards the end of this year um i expect the timelines to be somewhere in the order of 24 to maybe as long as 36 months before you would would have full approval to be able to um, to build and, and and operate become a mining operation. So timelines there. Um, look, you know, we should successfully uh, complete the EIS by 2025-26. Maybe the most positive um, number, base, uh, best case scenario, would be sometime in 2025. Three years for construction, um, which we showed in the feasibility study. It'll take roughly three years to construct, which puts you as a mining operation uh, by 2028, 29. Don't you love the permitting process? You know, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's not short, uh, but it is really, it's quite clear how you get there. And what I, I do like uh, a lot about working in the province of Saskatchewan, it, it's clear, it's spelled out. It's understood these are the steps you have to take. There's no shortcuts to uh, to get there. It takes time, but you know uh, this is uh, this is the environment we work in. But you know there's very very little political risk. You know so you may have other environments where permitting times are shorter, but the trade-off there is you may uh, see you know higher political risk. You know everything is is a bit of a trade-off, but I'm really really happy to be working in saskatchewan we're blessed with the best deposits uh the the best government system the regulatory process is there yeah I'm, you know it seems long but i think we can uh, we can find our way through so that's a great overview of the feasibility study why don't we move on now and discuss exploration what do you have planned for 2023 um, you know, as I said, we, we don't have any formal plans for exploration at the moment, but uh, I am considering probably in the latter half of this year to step out uh, doing some exploratory drilling on the, on the rest of the PLS property. You know, we're quite encouraged with, with the opportunities following the Patterson Lake corridor, but I think even more encouraging are, you know, just some, some targets that we've uh, seen on geophysics, there's, there's been, you know, a little bit of drilling we did a number of years ago that outlined the potential for mineralization further to the south um, by about a kilometer, we'll say, south of where the Triple R is located now. That looks like great prospective ground to me. I would love to get the drill back in that area, look for, um, you know, occurrences of mineralization. We're seeing the highest radon anomalies on the property that occur from there. And those radon sources are generally not very far away. So it means that you, you do have a uranium source nearby and maybe reflective of high grade. So I'm encouraged with, with those opportunities. I think we'll start exploring towards the end of, you know, the, the latter half of 2023 here. And then of course, we've, uh, we've staked other ground in the, uh, in the Athabasca Basin fairly recently as well. And I think that'll be also be part of the exploratory, uh, uh, work going ahead. I'm glad you brought that up because you did stake land around West Clough, which is or was a past producing mine. It has a very rich history. Maybe you can just tell us about that. Sure. Well, the Clough Lake mine itself, the old past producer, it's about 80 kilometers north of, um, of our PLS property. Uh, it is connected by Highway 955 that, that runs up. In fact, that's why the road was put there in the first place to be able to uh, provide access to the old Clough Lake mine. Um, 
it was mined out by Orano. Uh, their predecessor was was Arriva, and I think or Fujima, I think at the time when they when they finished mining it out. But um, 62 million pounds of, of high grade uranium came out of the ground near surface. Uh, we've staked ground that basically is very close. It's within about three kilometers or so of the Clough Lake, the old Clough Lake operation. We're about three kilometers to the west of it where our West Clough ground start and wraps around uh, a geologic feature called the, the Carswell structure. That's a basement hosted rock sitting in the middle of the Athabasca Basin. It's basically an uplifted tube of basement rock. Uh, for whatever reason, there was the, the high grade Clough Lake uranium deposits associated on the flank of that, um, that structure. And we basically st staked the whole western flank of, of the um, circular Carswell structure. So really good uh, uh, geologic potential, I think. You know, there's not been a whole lot of work done in the area there in the past, but that's something we're, you know, we've been very successful in as a group is taking, you know, various concepts like this and, and yeah, testing them and turning them these into world-class deposits. I mean, it, it's what we've done before in the past and uh, I'm hopeful we can uh, continue uh, doing the same going ahead. Ross, let's move on to your balance sheet now and discuss financials. You are sitting on $40 million in cash and short-term investments. How are you going to allocate this cash in the coming year? So really, that money that we have right now, $40 million, is earmarked for the uh, the type of work we're, we're doing right now, which is um, the advanced engineering design. Uh, next year, we'll start getting into procurement. Um, work as well, uh, all the costs associated with permitting and regulatory work plus community um, agreements. And uh, so, you know, so I think that we're probably in, in a, you know, a really nice position. We're, we're certainly good for everything we're, we're underway in 2023. We're covered for most of 2024 as well. So there isn't a huge need to raise new capital, but that's really where that, uh, 40 plus million dollars is earmarked towards. Um, any of the exploration activities I'm talking about right now, I haven't uh, considered the financing aspects of them yet. So we haven't, you know, the, the funds that you're seeing in the treasury really are devoted to the uh, to the work that we're doing to advance Triple R through the regulatory and uh, uh, I guess the advanced engineering process. Ross, I want to move on now and discuss valuation. Uh, when you look at pounds in the ground, Fission is trading relatively cheaply compared to some of your comps like NextGen or Denison. How do you explain that? Um, well, I think, you know, in uh, a lot of cases, it's um, they're further, you know, they're further advanced along the timelines between uh, where they're currently sitting and production. For example, I think NextGen are about a year and a half to two years ahead of us on the uh, on the timelines. They've already entered into their environmental impact assessment. But as we've uh, progressed our project moving forward, we have actually considerably um, decreased that valuation gap. If we had this conversation, say three years ago, I mean, we were about a three to one differential between our valuation of pounds on the ground and next gen and, and Denison. Well, that's now uh, close to less than about a, a two to one. I think that as we continue to move the project forward, show that yes, this is a very robust, viable prospect for turning into a mining operation. I think that that valuation will continue to close, and uh, you know, we're obviously looking to be measured on par with, with with the competitors. But I think you know we've made great progress in the past, and it's really all about. Uh, having refocus this company on the asset that we have and moving it forward through development that is uh, that has been what's allowed us to be able to close that gap and I think as we continue to move along we will um, you know I think we're going to achieve par with the, with our uh, other competitors as well so there is a great value proposition for investors to take a look at vision so it's all about de-risking much of the story is in de-risking De-risking and continuing to show the value, you know, that they be able to show that it is economically robust, um, you know, which I guess is part of de-risking, but yeah. 
One of your largest shareholders is CGN, a large utility out of China. Maybe you can just tell us about that relationship. How much do they own and how active are they? So CGN, you know, one of the two uh, Chinese state-owned utilities, they um, invested in Vision back in the, I guess it was January 2016. They initially bought a 19.9% equity stake in the company. Also was an offtake agreement in there as well. Um, over the years, they have not uh, participated in, in, you know, future financings that we've done. And so their, um, their overall percentage has actually decreased now to about 13.7% equity ownership. Um, they've not sold any shares in, in the company at all, but it's just they've been diluted down somewhat, not participated. I think they've been a great partner, to be honest. You know, everybody understands the you know the the Chinese growth story. Um, you know they're they're you know as far as on nuclear power buildouts, there's nobody stronger than the Chinese that way. Um, but I think you know having a you know a, a less than a you know 15% equity stake in, in in the company, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with with where they're they're at right now. As I said, there is a uh, an offtake agreement for up to 20% of our production that they would be paying uh, market price for spot price. Um, so I think they've been a, a great partner there. Uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, they're probably interested in having access to, to pounds to, uh, to help, uh, you know, supply their, their ever growing fleet of, of reactors in China. But, um, you know, I think it's been, it's been a good relationship uh, and probably will continue to do so. I know there's, a little bit of international tension out there between um, China, Canada, uh, still have a good relationship with China, US maybe a little less so. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see where that all goes, but for the time being, uh, you know, I think we're we're pretty comfortable with with that relationship and, you know, hopefully it'll uh, continue to, um, to remain that way. Ross, you also made a couple of recent additions to your management team and your board. Why don't you just tell us about those additions? Sure. At the at the board level, uh, we've recently announced uh, the addition of Beatrice Orantia. Um, she comes with a great deal of ESG and sustainability experience, so that brings a whole other um, you know needed component to, uh, at the board level. Uh, also, a recent hire on the technical team operations. We have our environmental manager now uh, with, so it really builds our horsepower internally understanding the whole uh, regulatory and permitting regime. So I, you know, I think we're firing on all cylinders right now as, as a company. I'm really quite pleased with our new additions. Ross, as we wrap up, what can investors expect in terms of news flow in the coming months from Vision Uranium? Right, well, I think just overall, um, you know, I think we're really in a strong uranium bull sector right now. And of course, we you know, we'll continue to remain active. We will be advancing PLS. We know that, um, you know, it certainly has a, a an excellent pathway through to production. Uh, news, of course, will be reflecting our steps as we as we move along through this this year. Um, look for us to announce where we are in the regulatory, where the permitting front. Um, look for further agreements on with our. Uh, local rights holders in the area. And I think as we, um, you know, perhaps as I mentioned in the latter part of, of 2023, we may be announcing further exploration work as well. So, uh, you know, I, I just think the whole sector is doing phenomenal and, and our project of course just continues to move forward. So I think there's plenty of news flow out there, um, you know, to keep, keep investors, uh, you know, looking, keeping eyes on our story. Well, that was a great overview and a great update on Fission Uranium, and congratulations on the feasibility study. That's a nice way to start the year. Once again, Ross, thank you. Thank you very much. Did you know that every time you hit the subscribe button, your name goes into a draw to win $1 million? I'm just kidding. But if you do subscribe, we will be very thankful. Thanks for your support.
Hi, Tim. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Saskatoon? Yeah, Jimmy, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, things are great. We've got a, a warm day out, out here and uh, yeah, things are terrific in Saskatoon. Thanks. Spring is in the air. Well, uh, I'm not that optimistic, but uh, we've got a few nice days anyways. Tim, the Athabasca Basin is very large and there are many companies operating there. And I want to provide a visual for our viewers. Where exactly is ISO Energy located in the basin? Yeah, so, you know, that's a part of our, our story. We're in the eastern part of the basin, Jimmy, and, and really Hurricane itself is up in the northeast corner of the basin. And you're right, it's a large, a large area. Um, next gen, you know, our, our majority owner is down in the southwestern part of the basin. And, you know, when we were formed, the, the idea was to, you know, split out some of their eastern, good eastern properties into another, another entity, and that became ISO Energy. Um, yeah, it, you know, it's an interesting part of the world. So, you know, where we're located on the east, um, you know, there's really a corridor of, of uranium projects. So if you, if you're flying up north, you'll, you know, at the south, southeast kind of corner, you'll, you'll hit Key Lake. And if you keep flying every 15 minutes, you look out the window, you'll, you'll, you'll fly by MacArthur and Cigar and up to McLean. And once you get up to McLean, you're just a, you're just a couple minutes from, from Hurricane. That's a great overview. 2022 was a year full of accomplishments with the primary one being the release of the resource on the hurricane deposit. Let's do a high level view of the hurricane resource, starting with the size, how many pounds and also what is the grade? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 2022 was an incredible year for ISO. So yeah, we put out the resource, the initial resource estimate in July. Um, that's 48.6 million pounds at an average grade of 34.5%. And there's another couple million pounds of inferred results on, or inferred uh, resource on top of that. Yeah, it's an incredible, you know, incredible project. And, and really, as a standalone resource, it's now the highest average grade resource uh, in the world. Did you say the average grade was 34%? Yeah, 34.5% over that 48.6 million pounds. So, Tim, put that into perspective for us. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the basin is characterized by incredibly high grades, right? So, you know, most, most deposits, you know, and companies will talk about grades that are 100 times the world average. Um, but, you know, the best resources in the basin are, you know, are incredibly high. I mean, you look at MacArthur Cigar, um, operating, you know, uh, mines, they've got incredibly high, high average grades, but they're, but even then they're not, you know, they're not at 34 and a half percent. There's, there's something lower, uh, but they're bigger, they're, they're bigger in scope and scale. So, you know, it's not to say within those, those massive deposits, there isn't a, a big pod that's at 34 and a half percent, but, but our standalone deposit, you know, if you think about it, it's really incredible in, in any commodity, not just uranium, if you take a cubic meter of dirt or or uh, uh, rock underground and you take a third of that a third of that is your actual mineralization which just you know doesn't happen anywhere but in in the basin uh it does happen from time to time with uranium and 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 uh, hurricane is just you know an example of one of the best best uh grades of any deposit uh up there and at 34 and a half percent you can truly say you are the world's highest grade resource we're the highest, yeah, the highest average grade uh, standalone resource. I mean, people people ask that, and like I said, there's there's definitely, you know, there's if you look at even Hurricane, I mean, we have uh, drill core that's you know 70 plus percent. If you go to any of these these deposits that have you know 10, 20 percent average grades, they've all got part parts of them that are at incredibly high grades. That's how you get to this average. But yeah, as a standalone you know resource. Uh, it, it is the highest grade um, uh, in the world. So as you mentioned at the onset, the hurricane deposit is located in the eastern portion of the basin and that offers up many advantages. Infrastructure being close to infrastructure is one of them. Can you tell us about some of the other advantages of being in that part of the basin? Yeah, I mean, well, first and foremost, our, our biggest strategic advantage is that grade, you know, just can't emphasize that enough because, you know, what it does is, is create an incredibly small footprint. So, you know, whether it's, you know, mining economics or environmentally, you know, that the, the smaller uh, the deposit, um, you know, the better, better you are if you have, if you've got these kinds of grades. So 
uh, that's an incredibly uh, big advantage. We're also shallow, so we're about 325 meters uh, in the basin, which, you know, just really to put in context, it just doesn't become an impediment. You've got MacArthur, Cigar, even Phoenix that, you know, the Denison guys are developing. Those are all at, at uh, deeper depths than, than 325 meters. So it's, it's only to say that, you know, there's, there's a lot of experience mining at those depths and, and certainly much deeper. And so um, it doesn't cause any, any issues for us. Um, it's also no water cover, you know, is another advantage. If you, you know, again, if you're flying up down that, that uranium corridor and you get up to Northern Saskatchewan, it's all trees and water. And so if you can find a great resource like this and at surface, there's no water, it just makes it that much easier to exploit, to, to, to mine down the road because you're not, you're not dealing with water at the surface. So that's an advantage. Um, and then, you know, one of the biggest things, you know, as well as just the jurisdiction, frankly, you know, the fact that we're in Saskatchewan, Canada, um, which historically is, you know, obviously had some of the best mines in the world and, and is seen by, you know, utilities around the world as, as one of the, you know, the best places to buy uranium, that, that jurisdiction is becoming even more important given, you know, geopolitical situation um, with respect to uranium coming out of places like Russia and even Kazakhstan, um, Saskatchewan is becoming more and more important. And the hurricane deposit also borders on another project that's owned by Chemical and Orano. Maybe you can just expand on that. Yeah, well, it's an interesting story. You know, if you if you look at our our slide deck, you see the the footprint of, of the resource, the sort of the plan view. And yeah, the 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 deposit grows in strength and size as you kind of get closer to the border that we have with, with that property, Don Lake, that you mentioned, which is owned by Cameco and Nerano. Um, you know, that's not our story. We don't own that, but but it is an interesting piece that that will play out over time. Um, you know, we're up at La Rock right now uh, doing winter drilling. On the other side of that border, just, just you know, a few hundred meters away, Cameco has a camp that they've built, and they're going to be doing drilling um, on that side to see, to see what else is on the other side. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, we'll continue to, to take hurricane forward, you know, based on, on, you know, what we, what we can control, which is hurricane. And then we'll, we'll take those steps, but yeah, certainly over time, it'll be very interesting to see, see what happens on the other side. And if this deposit uh, as a whole uh, grows in size. And so now that you have a resource of 48 million pounds, what are the next steps associated with this property? Yeah. So we're doing a lot of work right now internally. Um, because you know it is a, a world-class resort, and so we're looking at how do you, how would you go about mining uh, a deposit like this? There's a lot of a lot of work going on in the basin, uh, different technologies. Certainly, we're not again, we're not the biggest. So at, at 48, you know, right around 50 million pounds, um, you know, what would be the best way to to um, to go after that deposit? There's there's a lot of work being done on you know in situ recovery in the basin. There's there's other technologies. Arano has one called Saber, which is you know more of a directional drilling using using a, a jet boring um, technology from surface, or or you can go you know traditional underground, which you know has a lot of benefits, but also potentially you know different different costs and and economics. So we're looking at that. We're looking at how do you how do you most effectively take it forward, and also how do you deal with something like um, like a border if you're taking it forward on a standalone basis? How do you mine out that deposit? Recognizing that you've got uh, you got someone on the other side that you have to be uh, certainly aware of. And Tim, why not just keep growing the resource? You're at 48 million pounds. Why not try to double it or triple it so it it would become more attractive to somebody like Cameco or Arano? Well, I mean, we we'd love to, Jimmy. I mean, you know, we've got a great exploration team, and and you know what we did before we put out the resource is do a lot of work around the other outside boundaries to to really identify, do we have the footprint of this of this resource? And 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 we think we do for the most part. I mean, there's certainly you know additional infill drilling that can be done to to firm up you know some of that resource and take it to a higher higher standard. But but effectively, we think we've got you know the, the majority of that resource. You know, for good or bad, it, the rest of it it looks to be on the other side of a border. So so that that's why it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, we don't know how much is there, but we know that. You know the the strongest part of our deposit is right on that line. So so there's something there. It's just a matter of how much and 
and uh, and what does it look like? So let's move on and discuss your exploration program. Before yeah. but before we jump into that, you recently hired Daryl Clark as VP of Exploration. He has a very yeah. extensive background, a very interesting background. Maybe you can just expand on that. Yeah, no, thanks for asking that. I mean, Daryl uh, is just joining us officially. He'll come on in, in March. He's already getting his, his head into what ISO is doing. But yeah, I, I don't think it's it's uh, it's it's an overstatement to say that he, in many ways he's a game changer for ISO Energy. He's got enormous experience um, in uranium exploration, um, but also in in mine development and mine operation. So he was uh, a VP of exploration at Cameco for a number of years. Um, I got to know him there. Um, really respect what he, he 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 does and what he did there, and 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 grew to trust him, you know, in that role. And you know, it was just uh, it was just a great opportunity to bring him on. So he w he went on from uh, being a VP of X to to overseeing Cameco's operations in Kazakhstan, um, the JV Inkai in situ recovery operation there. And then most recently, he was he was actually he shifted gears and he was the general manager of the Fort Hills um, project uh, oil project in Fort McMurray. So. You know, he just has enormous skills, and I just, when we were looking for a new VP, I just called him, just more so, just to get his advice and see if he he knew some some names. And I was incredibly excited when he told me he was looking to get back to, you know, really what's his passion, which is uranium exploration and development. You know, he's got a PhD in in uh, in in geology, um, economic geology, and so he, that's that's what he loves to do. And so, yeah, bringing him on is is just terrific for us. I bet he has some interesting stories about his time in Kazakhstan. Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to have a, a lack of story, you know, storytelling as we, you know, get to know each other even even better over the over the next, you know, months and years to come. Um, yeah, he's an incredibly, you know, interesting and experienced guy with, you know, global experience, not just in Kazakhstan, but you know, across you know, a number of different jurisdictions and different commodities as well. So he's not just uranium and oil, but he's 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 worked in coal and gold and 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 yeah, just a just a vast amount of experience. So we spent a lot of time discussing Hurricane. Let's move on and discuss your other properties. You you have more than 20 properties in your portfolio. Which ones are you going to focus on in this current exploration program? Yeah, that's right. We yeah we do have we have more than 20. Um, yeah, the last you know year or so has been really interesting, Jimmy, because you know when we were focused on Hurricane, obviously you know it's an incredible project, but being focused there, really, you know, the team had you know, had one goal, and it was to explore there, you know, delineate that deposit. And now that we've got that done, and and we're kind of moving more to a development stage, we've got this team that that we're we're leveraging and putting onto these other properties that were sitting on the on the back shelf, and it's actually really exciting, and, you know, in bringing on a guy like Daryl, where he's got the you know a lot of experience on you know process driven experience on how to take these projects forward in a in a very uh, deliberate way is, is is exciting for us. So right now uh, we're actually drilling as as we speak. We've got two two drills going on two different projects. Um, one is is still on the La Rock East project, but kind of up in the northeast corner. Um, La Rock sort of in the middle and down to the south is where Hurricane is. Northeast corner is is a is part of the project called the Kernahan Trend, which uh, we did a bit of work on this summer. Really liked what we saw, so we're back there drilling six holes. Um, we're also on our Hawk project, which is a little bit southwest of La Rock, uh, east in the Hurricane project, and that'll be our first drilling on that project. But we did some geophysics uh, a little while ago and really liked what we saw with the conductors there. It's a little bit deeper, given that it goes in a bit, but really exciting because it's uh, it's largely untested ground, and uh, and we really like uh, we really like that project. Um, in addition to that, you know, we are doing some geophysical work as well to follow up on some. Uh, past drilling. So the Rockies, we're doing some more geophysics, uh, ground geophysics this winter, as well as the Geiger project. And when does this current drilling program end? Yeah, we'll be up there for several more weeks. We're we're into both, you know, both uh, both projects with uh, you know more than half of of that work left to go. So we'll be in there well into into March. We'll get it done, you know, as soon as we can, so we don't hit any you know timing issues with ice coming out and things like that. But but we'll be there for several more weeks. And when does the summer program begin? Yeah, I mean it, it, it depends a little bit on on weather, but yeah, we'll we'll hope to be back up there 
you know, it kind of, you know, it, the turnaround time is not that long. So if you're out by, you know, March, April, you're, you're hoping to be back by June, July. I'm sure those drillers enjoy the summer program more so than the winter program. Well, it, it depends. You know, it, it's interesting. I mean, certainly when it's 40 below, um, that's some tough. That's some tough work. Like those, the, the drillers, the geo geos up there. Like it, it's incredible what they go through. When it's nice, when it's you know even minus 10 or you know minus 15, I think they like the winter quite a bit. The summer is great, but it you know it's kind of offsetting the harsh cold with you know the bugs. <laughs> so it's a tough environment no matter what the season. Uh, but yeah, just probably a little bit of personal preference. Tim, you have a very interesting background. Before you became the CEO of ISO Energy, you were marketing uranium globally for Cameco. So you bring a totally different perspective to the table than a geologist would. And I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on the current term market. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it seems like a bit of a lifetime ago already, but yeah, for you know many years I was selling uranium conversion uh, to utilities, you know, all over the place, Europe, Asia, North America. And um, yeah, you know, it's still, you know, still a first love, you know, understanding the market, what's going on. And, you know, really what it does is it, it helps me be even more incredibly excited about a company uh, like ISO Energy and the project that we have in Hurricane, because, you know, the uranium market and equities, they've, you know, everything's been a little bit flat for the last few months, I'd say, not a lot of excitement, but you know, behind the scenes, like the fundamentals are just so incredibly strong and they're strengthening. So, you know, you saw a lot of stuff happening even this week, Cameco announced they're increasing production. And well, you know, I think that's really telling of how they see the market turning and, and the demand that's going to be out there. So, um, you know, this whole, this whole idea, you know, the narrative around nuclear has just gotten better and better as you've seen. And, and there's, there's countries and companies that are all recommitting or committing for the first time to nuclear and growth. And that just, you know, that just means that, you know, the supply demand imbalance that we have right now, like there's already a huge gap between what's needed each year um, for on the demand side with what's coming out of primary production. And if you, if you, you read UXC, which is sort of the market leader in price, you know, price uh, reporting and, and consulting, one of the things they, they said recently, which you know, I never thought I'd hear them say, is that you know the era of the inventory overhang is is gone, and so you know there's no inventory that's just sitting there waiting to you know save everybody when they need more uranium, and there's a big gap. So it's just to say that there's you know a, a need for new economic production, um, and and there's a need for that in the right jurisdictions. You know, Saskatchewan being probably the best of them. I mean, whether it's the U.S., maybe Australia, but there's, there's no place that you know is is better to mine uranium in than than uh, the northern Saskatchewan, and you know to be ISO Energy having you know this incredible deposit hurricane, this new um, you know highest grade um, deposit in the world. Uh, yeah, it, it just makes it really exciting to to think ahead to how how we're going to be able to contribute to that to that supply story. Great insights. Tim, as we wrap up, can you summarize what investors can expect from ISO Energy in the coming months? Yeah, I mean, right now, again, we, we're drilling right now. So, you know, we're certainly going to be uh, reporting on those drill results as they come in. Uh, we're certainly going to be planning ahead and, and with Daryl and the team, you know, looking ahead in a, even a more, like I said, more deliberate fashion than maybe we have in the last couple of years. We'll, we'll be putting out what that summer program is going to be looking like soon. Um, so those those results you know, and, and that news will come out. We're internally, like I said, we're also doing work to to see how we can advance hurricanes. So uh, it's not that we're going to put out, you know, any economics on that in the very near term, but we're doing the work and a, and a lot of it behind the scenes in order to get ourselves ready to make decisions. Like, do you go forward with a with a, a PEA, for instance? And and we'll be, you know, we'll be looking to make uh, to do that work to get the answers internally and and, and make those decisions, you know, in the months to come. Well, Tim, that was a great update, and we wish you success with your current drilling program. Once again, thank you. Jimmy, thanks so much.
Hi, Pierre. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Boston? Hi, Jimmy. Great to be back. Uh, it's, uh, it's a nice sunny day in Boston. I don't spend much time here these days, but uh, in the winters, I tend to be away. I'm busy on traveling and work and things. But uh, yeah, back for, back for a day anyway to uh, reacquaint myself with my place. So the Boston Bruins are really on a tear this year. Are they going to go all the way? I mean, it's, uh, it's, I see very little that's pointing any other direction than that right now. Of course, playoffs are always playoffs, but uh, but so far it's been absolutely amazing. So I really, really enjoy seeing them doing well. And with the Swedish goalie and a few other Swedes on there too, it always makes me happy. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great, great to be in Boston. So Pierre, let's move on now and discuss uranium. WMC Energy is involved in the buying and selling of uranium for your various clients. And I want to get a better understanding of who these clients are. Are they financial players? Are they producers, utilities? Give us some background on this. Uh, sure. Actually, we are, our, our team has expanded a fair bit as well now. So we're, uh, we're actually six people in our, in our uranium team now. And uh, so with that comes a lot of coverage as well. So I would say we... We pretty much talk to anyone in the in the uranium in the nuclear fuel market uh, period. So while well, we're we're avoiding Russians, as most people do these days, but other than that, we pretty much talk to everybody, and that includes every utility, every producer, intermediaries, traders, banks, anyone with an interest in uranium. Uh, we would like to sit down and talk to them and just get to know them, get to know their needs, what they want, and uh, and try to help them out. So that's uh, it's, uh, it's a fun community. I really enjoy it. And I got uh, some really nice colleagues on board now too. So we're, uh, we're a great team. And these clients that you speak to, are they based in the US, Europe, Asia? Uh, the ones that I talk to, uh, mostly Europe, because I used to cover the European market when I worked with Chemico. So I have some, uh, it's getting old now, but it's almost 20 years I've been calling on them. So it's, uh, and some of them are still there. Uh, so, and considering my family and friends and college buddies and what have you is is over in Europe. So I really like to head over there. Um, but, uh, but I would say the majority of my time, at least 80% is uh, purely dedication to, uh, to Sprott and their uranium trust these days. So something I really enjoy as well. That's, I'm glad you brought that up because I do want to touch on that. But before we do that, I want to get a little bit more information from you on what the utilities are doing. This time last year, the focus was on Russia, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Are utilities still concerned about possible restrictions on Russian sourced uranium, or is it business as usual now that it's been a year? Yeah, I would say it was obviously in the beginning, right when the invasion happened, you had, I mean, uh, it was turned the market upside down. Uh, and it, it, I still like to highlight the, the Swedish utility Vattenfall that went out four hours after the invasion and, uh, invasion and just uh, said, no, we're done. No more Russian deliveries. So we're going to find it elsewhere. So that was uh, self-imposed sanctions. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of other utilities that followed suit. Slightly disappointing maybe, but uh, but then uh, there was a lot of talk of sanctions early on after and the market got a bit rattled. Then it sort of calmed down and it seemed like, yeah, it's too far out. No one really cares about it. But just uh, early this year with uh, there was some WNA working group meetings in London with most a lot of European uh, entities uh, come and sit together and discuss current topics. And then there was another NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute conference in DC uh, a little while ago, again, when those topics came up. And it, and it is a very hot topic. Uh, right now, it just flared up in the last few weeks. And with the anniversary coming up on the invasion, there are, depending on, regardless of whether there are actual sanctions put in place or not, I think enough entities are now taking it seriously that we can't, that we can't ignore this anymore. So I think there will be some sort of self-imposed sanctions not maybe not for everybody but but certainly for uh for a majority of entities that it's something they have to take seriously you can't really ignore it anymore so they can be self-imposed restrictions but are utilities concerned about the u.s government and and if they might impose some sort of restrictions on russian sourced uranium or conversion and enrichment services uh, I mean, I think they have to take it seriously, and not every utility is exposed to to Russian deliveries. They never had it in the portfolio, some certainly are. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, your job is to make sure you get to have uranium and uh, nuclear fuel for your power station, so you have to take it seriously. I don't think there's going to be restrictions slapped on it and an immediate halt to it. I think what's being discussed more is some kind of phased-in approach where you you have a few years to to let the contract expires, but any new contracts, I, I think 
people probably look elsewhere. So let's move on now and discuss the spot market. As you mentioned, you are responsible for securing pounds for the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust or the Sput product. And in the last few weeks, we've seen Sput trade at a premium and therefore it's able to raise cash. You've been out in the market buying pounds. Why don't you give us a little bit of color on the spot market? And I'm just kind of curious what it's like, how tight it is right now. Is it easy to secure a million pounds of uranium or is it still rather tight? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Obviously, early on in 2021, it was very easy to source a million pounds. You can buy that on a day. That was no problem at all. Uh, then it got, uh, I think it was about September, I got the same question. And and at that time, yeah, if you had gone out to try to buy a million pounds, the market really would run away from you. So we we talked about that with uh, with Sprott as well. And it's like, what well, is a good approach on this? Because it's not really... In, and not certainly not in ours, and I don't think anyone's interested that you just go and chase offers and you drive the market up several dollars only to run out of cash, and then the market just comes crashing down again when you're gone because it, it's disappointing, but it's very few uh, buyers in the spot market. So it's it's been spot has done the absolute majority of it. Um, so anytime anytime we haven't been there on the bid side, it just seems like it's very empty and very soft. So haven't been active either for the last quarter so that obviously there is off takes coming in so that means that some of the entities selling have kind of replenished their inventories i wouldn't say they're they're flushing uranium it's certainly tighter than there has been for uh for the last year or so now looking at that too when we haven't been around for about uh, three months here in q4 it was normally you would expect the market to drift down but it actually held up uh which was the positive surprise i think too um, so there, there's clearly not a constant flow of material that has to be sold in the market that we've seen before. So I think a lot of those inventories and a lot of those pounds are already spoken for. And uh, when we did see prices dip down earlier in the fall, it was maybe 46, 47, later 48. You saw a couple of utilities come in and pick up that material uh, and even producers. So there was four or five buyers that picked away at a few hundred thousand pounds at a time. Uh, whenever the market dipped down, that's still there. We've seen that in the last couple of weeks too, but now that level is not 46, 47 anymore. It's, I think, anything under uh, anything under 50 is uh, is a good, is what people consider a good deal. So you do have producers, producers that are short, so they need to buy material at some point. And then utilities actually see it as, uh, let's just secure some pounds. They're going to need it at some point anyway, who knows? when the market, uh, what the market's going to do here in the next few months. So in my view that you have that 50 almost feels like a bit of a floor. And then obviously the upside, then who knows what's going to happen there. But uh, it's the, as far as uh, the downside goes, it feels very, very limited uh, with pounds under $50. And I'm curious where these pounds are coming from, the pounds that are for sale. Are they coming from producers, offtake agreements? What are they exactly? Uh, mostly intermediates that we find where we found these pounds, but uh, but they obviously get it from somewhere, whether it's offtake or, or inventories they have. But uh, it's uh, yeah, I don't I can't name any specific names, but it's uh, but it's people that we've certainly dealt with before uh, where we find this. And the fact that we haven't been in the market for the last few months, obviously, then uh, they 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 have a little bit of stuff to sell, but it's not that. It's not where you get the phone rings off the hook and people say you have to buy my pounds. Uh, that it's more it's more me chasing people these days. But that's uh, that's uh, I think that's a healthy sign for the market as well that you don't have that big spot overhang anymore. That's a good overview of the spot market. Let's move on now and discuss the long-term contracting market. Many people have said 2022 was the beginning of a new long-term contracting cycle. UXC estimates over 114 million pounds was contracted in 2022, the largest since 2012. I'm going to put you on the spot now, Pear. What will that number be in 2023? Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> I would say, I mean, it's going to be higher than 114. And I would say also... 114 million, as you would like, they have a very good insight into the market. Do they see everything? I don't think so, because uh, Chemical alone reported 77 million pounds sold, and I, I struggle to think that their market share is that big. So I think there is contracting going on as well. So that it's actually a higher number than 114. But again, this year, uh, not everything will be reported. But uh, so 
regardless of what the number, the public number is, I actually think it's higher. Uh, but I would say that number, 150 is probably not a bad, bad start, might be higher. Um, it's uh, like kind of most been touched on before, I think that it's been a lot of uh, conversion and enrichment that has been, uh, that has been procured over the last six months or so, or in the middle of it, we still have a, a pretty healthy inflow of both conversion and, uh, and enrichment tenders from utilities. So that hasn't really slowed down, but the natural follow-up of this is of course, that once you procure those products, you move to UT08. Now there's definitely tenders for enriched uranium products, so EUP, where you combine all three of them into one, but, uh, but nevertheless, you, there is enough sort of, uh, separate products that uh that, it, that are being procured and it, it will move to u308 and i think we'll see we'll see a record year since uh since fukushima for sure and with regard to the long-term contracting market and with utilities has their procurement strategies changed this past year given what's happening with russia and also the tightness of the market overall yeah absolutely it, it has uh i mean the nuclear industry as a whole already started picking up speed because of decarbonization and electrification, but uh, but the the Russia invasion of Ukraine certainly has sped things up. So uh, they are there is a focus on it. Like you, you're looking, you've been working down inventories uh, to the thought when things started tighten up a little bit. It's not going to be that last for that long. So you start working down inventories now when you realize that. This is probably going to last a while, and and Russian material is probably not going to be procured for for quite a few years. So then, not only do you want to replenish your inventories, you probably want to beef up your strategic inventories a little bit. So we're not even at replacement rates when it comes to how many pounds are procured each year. So you got to get back up to that, and you're actually going to overshoot it a bit too. So that's that's why I will think we'll see those numbers pick up quite a bit. And as far as utilities goes. Um, regular utilities, absolutely, they will try to beef up their inventories and continue their contracting. But when you see a very, a very unique or a very niche uh, group of utilities are the ones with the Russian design, VVER, it's the Russian pressurized water reactor. Great design. Uh, they've been working flawlessly over the last, I don't know, I don't know, around, but three, four decades, five decades, maybe even. Um, but those utilities, when they procure these Russian design reactors, they also get uh, life of plant fuel supply from the russians now the europe uranium supply agency in europe is obviously saying to these that we can't rely on russia anymore so you need to move away from russian fuel supply and then they need to go to the western uh fuel suppliers and it's a different shape of the fuel bundle so the western fuel manufacturers not a lot of them can manufacture these at hexagonal instead of uh instead of square uh, Westinghouse is one of them that can, so a lot of these utilities is, is a handful that are in Finland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Hungary. They need to reach out and, and procure for this first the fuel elements themselves, and once they have those, then they can start looking for uranium enrichment and conversion, and we've seen that happen. Uh, the, the Finnish uh, utility Fortum, they publicly said that they concluded a contract with, uh, with Westinghouse for fuel fabrication in November, and yeah, the, more or less the next day they came out for a tender, so they are currently out, and we're expecting the other utilities to come with this too. And this is not insignificant uh, demand that's coming for the market, and it's also not normal that you see almost in-year demand for enriched uranium products. So this is also going to put put some pressure on the market. So as you mentioned, there's the narrative toward nuclear power has never been better. We have a massive build out in China. They're building, I believe, 150 new reactors between now and 2035. Japan said they were also gonna start up their nuclear reactors. I think they said 15 to 16 by sometime later this year. And yet we still have uranium hovering around the $50 price. With all these positives within the sector, why aren't we seeing uranium at a much higher price, like 60 or $70 a pound? I think it's uh, the utilities don't really procure in the spot market, right? So they, they do long-term contracts, bilateral contracts with, uh, with large suppliers. So it, it's, and it's, it's very difficult to, to connect the term price they're contracting at and the spot market because Normally, the connection there is that uh, if the term price, you have enough contango that the term price is high enough, 
entities such as ourselves, WMC or other intermediaries, they would just buy material in the spot market, finance it and sell them out in time. But the contango is not uh, strong enough right now. There's always the financing is very expensive, but there also isn't that much spot material around either. So that trade hasn't really been able to work out for the last year or so, I would say. Um, so what we need to see first is uh, is a higher term price. And uh, and that's the fr not frustrating bits, but it's but it is chemical clearly is, is selling their material at a higher price than what's being published. And there was uh, some frustration expressed from them too that it's it's clear that they're winning business at prices higher than what's being published by price reporters. But at the same time, there are lower offers that are not being accepted, but there are offers lower. And those are the numbers being published. So it's clearly, is a, I mean, I want to say it's a bifurcated market, but there is certainly chemical can extract the premium um, in the market, but that's not necessarily reflected in, uh, in what we're seeing as published prices. So it's that obviously needs to be addressed, but, and I think it will be. There is enough demand hitting the market that the term price has got to start going to move. And then once it does that, I think the spot market will follow too. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's very opaque. Even if you're in the middle of it, it's quite opaque. So obviously for, a, for an investor on the outside, I, 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 I can certainly understand uh, the confusion and why things not moving. And, but yeah, it's, I, I am quite convinced that the spot market will move and it will move quite a bit. It's just a matter of when things move very slowly. But uh, but throughout the course of this year, I like I said, I think fifty dollars is a floor, and uh, and it, there is only really one way to go from here. And recently, Kazataprom said they their production numbers for 2023, 2024 will be reduced by 45 million pounds. That should also have a positive impact on the uranium price. I, I mean, I think it will have to. Uh, I and I wouldn't be. I don't know their uh, their uh, contracting situation, of course, but uh, but I have to assume that some of those pounds were probably already sold, which means that they will need to replenish them in the market. And yeah, and I mean, they you see them in the market every now and then, just like Cameco is in there buying every now and then as well. And and uh, I, I think it's healthy. I think it's good for them. A lot of the deliveries are pegged to the spot market, so it's not. It's not inconceivable that they have an interest in being in there and, and certainly be involved in the spot market anyway and to get a better understanding for it. Pierre, as we wrap up, are there any major events investors should be looking for in the coming months? Uh, yes, I think there is one. Uh, and that's, I think, every, the entire nuclear industry is looking at this. And, uh, and I think certainly it, it behooves investors as well to, to monitor this as much as they can. And it's the... Uh, the restart of the convertized uh, conversion facility in Metropolis, uh, Illinois. It's uh, it really is needed. Uh, we we needed conversion to, uh, to just be available in this industry because as we touched on before, uh, enrichment capacity in the West is tight. So they are moving from well, the underfeeding is gone. Uh, Urenco is now publicly admitting that they they no longer underfeeding. They're moving towards overfeeding and. In order to enable that, you need conversion, and that will translate into uh, demand for U308 as well. So we we just, I mean, e even if it's not a perfect restart, I think the market can certainly absorb a little bit of a delay. But uh, but it's just we need it for a healthy market. So utilities want it to work, producers want it to work, uh, intermediaries want it to work, and I think also investors. Uh, this, we, I. Converdine is really focusing on getting it up and running. I spent quite a bit of time with them lately. I have every confidence in that they will make this work, uh, but it's definitely, it's gonna happen late March, early April. And uh, I think uh, everybody's just holding their breath and making sure that I uh, wish them all the best and, and hope it works out. So, but it's it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. And as, uh, as another investor, of course, uh, ears to the ground as far as uh, Russian sanctions go, both in Europe and uh, and in North America. It's uh, That can certainly, have a near-term impact on the market too. Well, Pierre, I want to thank you for spending time with us today and sharing your views and your insights on the uranium market. Once again, thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Anytime.
Hi, Lee. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Adelaide? Yeah, terrific. Thanks, Jimmy. And uh, absolute pleasure uh, to be on your show today. And how is the weather? I'm sure it's a lot better than it is in Canada. Yeah, it's 40 degrees uh, Celsius today, so it's, it's going to be a warm one. But uh, it's early in the morning here, so uh, still pretty, pretty pleasant. Lee, I want to start our conversation with a discussion on jurisdiction. One thing that has become very apparent in the past year is the security of supply and not relying on other countries for critical materials. An interesting element that many people might not be aware of is that 71% of uranium production is from state-owned companies. And because NextGen is located in one of the greatest mining jurisdictions in the world, it's not state-owned. And that's a big benefit. And I want you to speak to this and also speak to what a great jurisdiction the province of Saskatchewan is to be located in. Yeah, absolutely, Jimmy. And, and you're quite right. I think it's a, an element. You know, mining, mine production is subject to two risks, technical and sovereign risk. And you've, you've correctly pointed out that a very large percentage of the world's uranium production is located in countries which are assessed as very significant sovereign risk. When you also take into account that the US in 2022 imported over 45% of its nuclear fuel requirements from Russia, uh, with the EU being in a similar situation, uh, it really does highlight just the significance of what has been occurring over the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years in terms of uh, countries' reliance on those um, high-risk sovereign locations, um, has put us put put the world into um, a, a situation where we are subject to um, those countries and their, uh, for want of a better word, regimes. And with respect to the USA, fifty million pounds of uranium is consumed every year yet they produce less than one domestically. And so it's going to be absolutely critical that the US relies on its, its neighbour of Canada and also its, its friendly southern country, uh, Australia, of which I'm a dual citizen of both, um, uh, in terms of their uranium needs. But it's also greater than that. I would say Europe's reliance on those countries which have deemed high significant risk is also of a, of a similar magnitude. Um, when I started NextGen, you know, I'm the type of person, I, I can totally accept technical risk, but I can't accept sovereign risk. Mining is, is a very challenging industry and, and uh, it has met enough risks as it is, let alone sovereign risk. So, you know, I, I had a choice to go anywhere in the world. Australia's got a fantastic code. Um, with respect to uranium uh, permitting and, and production. Um, yet in Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, they are the, by far the world leaders when it comes to permitting a resources project, any, any resources project for that matter, but specifically uranium. And then when you consider the geological setting of the Athabasca Basin, having over a hundred times the world's you know, average grade of production on average across the deposits, um, for me, that uh, technical setting plus the sovereign um, profile um, is uh, what made, made my decision for me to, uh, to start in, in Saskatchewan and um, uh, going through a permitting process, which we'll talk a, a little bit about later. It's, it's, it really has highlighted to me, having gone through it in Canada, uh, sorry, Australia previously in the early 2000s, just how how Saskatchewan really does lead the world when it comes to um, the sovereign management of a resources project. Yeah, probably the only negative would be the weather. Yeah, <laughs> it does get very warm in in uh, Saskatchewan as well. I've experienced the high 30s, low 40s um, in the middle of uh, July out at the project site, and then conversely, the minus 40s um, in, in January. So, uh, yeah, all, all seasons over in uh, Saskatchewan, for sure. That's a great overview. Let's move on now, and I want to discuss the feasibility study, because through the feasibility study, we can see the economics associated with uh, Rook 1. 
and just how robust it is. And can you just provide a brief overview of the feasibility study, just touching on the net present value, also the internal rate of return and, and what the payback is? Yeah, well, let, let's uh, take the uh, $50 a pound spot price as the average price over um, uh, the life of the mine. Um, it's $1.3 billion, and all figures I, I, I'm about to uh, state are in Canadian dollars. It's $1.3 billion uh, capex. It'll have an operating cost basis of under $10 a pound and producing 30 million pounds per annum over the first five years and an average of 22 million pounds per annum over the initial 11.7 uh, uh, years. Now, I want to just highlight that 11.7 years, we are permitting for a 24-year mine life. We have a significant resource volume in the inferred category that will move into the measured and indicated once we um, complete greater density drilling on that part of the ore body. Um, but as seen with the history of the Arrow deposit, the correlation of uh, inferred going into indicated is actually higher than one-to-one. -one. So uh, it's with great confidence that we're permitting for a 24-year mine life. Um, the unique aspect uh, is that 30 million pounds per annum based on 2022 production numbers will be producing uh, in the into the uh, mid to low 20 percent of the entire world's production and it's incredible to think that's coming from a mine which has has an actually very tiny uh, footprint the footprint of which would fit in the rogers arena in toronto with the surrounding infrastructure in terms of the the surface expression we are only really moving ore uh, that is the equivalent of one double decker bus a day uh, so it's actually going to be one of the world's tiniest underground mines. And the economics are incredibly robust. There's no doubt about it. Um, and, and, but the, one of the elements to it is that we've purposefully designed an environmental management system, which will mean it's one of the most elite managed mines globally. And that is a function of not only the, the design, but also the natural technical setting. We're in co very competent rock, where it have an exceptionally clean metallurgy. That's what you get with these basement hosted deposits. And so, you know, from a, a technical setting perspective, we have a number of advantages, but we've taken the opportunity to also design into it that most elite environmental management perspective. And the underground tailings management system is one of those aspects where it costs extra capex, it costs extra opex, but it's elite from an environmental mine management perspective. And given the robust economics of the project, uh, we can certainly afford to accommodate that design aspect into the project. I've given you one example in the underground tailings management uh, facility, but there is a whole plethora of examples where we are really zeroing in to ensure that this mine is the most environmentally elite managed mine in the world and having the lowest carbon footprint um, uh, achievable. And the, the, the consequence of producing 30 million pounds per year is that it takes off the equivalent of 70 million vehicles a year off the road in CO2 equivalent. There's no project in the world that has that type of uh, carbon offsetting uh, profile from a base low power source. And so, we are covering at NextGen environmental excellence, economic you know, phenom, and then also from the uh, sovereign profile, providing the world's uh, nuclear fleet in the US and in Europe. Um, I've mentioned those two particularly because they're so reliant on those countries uh, for their fuel services that have uh, significant technical risk. We are uh, uh, ideally positioned to help resolve the particular aspect that you mentioned at the beginning of this call. When we discussed the economics of the feasibility study, you were using $50 uranium, and I think we would all agree uranium is going a lot higher. If we were to use a higher number, like 75, how would the economics look? Yeah, $50 uh, a pound. 
the NPV of the project's $3.6 billion, incorporating an 8% discount rate. Um, at $50 a pound, uh, on a free cash flow basis, this would take NextGen into the top 15 mining companies worldwide from a single asset in the best location uh, that uh, exists on the planet from a, a sovereign perspective and with an elite environmental uh, profile. At $75 a pound, we're not getting, we're in the top 10. And at, at $100 a pound, we are knocking on the door of the top five. And, and in the top five, you've got Rio Tinto, BHP, the, the, the big uh, companies that have 100-year uh, histories. So, you know, the, the economics of the, of the project are phenomenal. And at $50 a pound, no one out there currently in production is making returns on capital at all. They're making negative returns. So um, for all the investors out there, $50 a pound is really your base case scenario, particularly if you want the uranium source from uh, uh, Western world countries such as Canada, uh, the US and Australia. Canada, undoubtedly, of those three countries has the lowest uh, cost per pound profile. Uh, it would be followed by Australia and, uh, and then the US from a, a pure uranium mining perspective. We've got Olympic Dam here in South Australia, but it's a byproduct of the, of the copper production. So it's effectively for free. But um, from a pure mining perspective, yeah, Canada leads the world. And that's a function of the grade, um, as I mentioned earlier on in the call. And uh, you know, with respect to the lead technical setting, we, we don't incur a lot of the capex and, and the opex that other mines do in the Athabasca Basin because we're in such competent ground setting. And uh, so we, we, we have incredible, uh, an incredible profitability profile, 90% margins at a $50 a, a pound uranium price, but all investors out there, you know, it's with great confidence that they can expect the uranium price uh, as we go through this decade to get significantly higher. I experienced the uranium price rise in the early 2000s, went from $7 a pound to 140. Uh, what I can accurately convey is that back in the 2000s, when we saw that price rise, the, the, uh, the top five mines that were in production then are no longer in production today. And the cost profile of today's mines are higher that are currently in production than back then today. So, you know, I'm very data fa and fact driven with respect to making investment decisions. And I look at costs. I'm, I was, well, I'm still a chartered accountant, so it's inherent in me. I'm very focused on costs and return on capital. But uh, for, for the world's production, it needs in, in a, a much higher uranium price. For Western world production, it needs another price again on top of that. And from a demand perspective, you know, I've been in the sector since the year 2000. I've never uh, witnessed uh, such generalist support for nuclear energy. It really does typify that uh, the world is now really judging nuclear on science fact as opposed to false ideology. It's an incredible power source. There's no doubt about it. Um, but car carbonization of the globe is a significant issue and decarbonizing the globe, the only way you can do it, the only way, unless you have a river flowing nearby, which has the water volume to justify hydro, the only way you can do it is through nuclear energy. That's a great segue into exploration. You've said in the past that you're not looking to grow arrow, you're looking for another arrow, and you're going to do that through exploration. Why don't you just provide us with a brief overview of the Pat Patterson corridor and the structural cracks and, and just what it means to growing this project even larger? Yeah, sure, Jimmy. And, and you're quite right. Arrow is the world's largest, highest grade project under, under development. And we've got to, we know it's going to grow. We've already proven that. But economically and sensibly it's best to do that once we've sunk the underground infrastructure subsequently 
now that we're so advanced in the permitting and, and in the final stages of engineering design, it really has freed up the exploration team to get back to exploration. We had a hiatus of about two to three years um, on, on dedicated exploration at, uh, at next gen. And so very, very exciting. We, we did a small program last year. We found more mineralization under arrow. So it really does validate that, that, that geological belief that arrow is really just the top of a far larger system at depth. But that Patterson corridor, which also hosts, uh, the triple R deposit, uh, owned by, uh, fission uranium, it's probably the main, the same mineralizing event um, going through those cracks, which which are in a, a northeasterly, southwesterly direction through that Patterson, or th through that part of the southwestern part of the the uh, Athabasca Basin. Um, Arrow, we found it on the very uh, on the twenty first drill hole on that corridor on the very first drill hole on that target. Um, we have only explored just on the next gen ground about 10% of that Patterson corridor, uh, which also hosts seven kilometers away, the, the fission triple R deposit. We have another nine corridors on the Rook One property that we have not explored to any significant extent. We could have 10 rigs for 10 years on Rook One alone and still not complete anywhere near a geological evaluation of the uranium mineralization on that tenement alone. We also subsequently have SW1, which is to the west of Rook 1, and SW3, which is to the east of uh, Rook 1. And uh, the corridors exist on those properties as well. Um, we've commenced the exploration program, uh, and uh, it's always exciting when you've got the drill rigs going. And but I I appreciate your your reiteration, and it's very important for all investors to know. Again, we're not incrementally looking to expand Arrow. We are looking for new arrows, and I think Arrow sometimes or the discovery of Arrow conveys that it's uh, relatively easy. It's not. Uh, these things are very uh, unique. Um, they uh, require many many years of um of analysis studies and and also looking back what people had done prior to us even exploring uh before us next gen holding the tenements and also looking at what other people are doing in the area there's no doubt that this southwestern section of the of the athabasca basin is going to be the future of canadian uranium production uh well into the back end of this century um and so for everyone involved at the project, uh, it's incredibly exciting. And this year, we're also having a number of uh, university students from right around the world, from geological um, uh, schools right around the world, even some here from Adelaide, are going to be going up to our site because, because of the learning environment that we've got and the geological phenom that it is. It just, you know, attracts such strong geological interest. Lee, you recently released details of your upcoming exploration program. It's going to be a very extensive one. Maybe you can just touch on the highlights and where are you going to be focused in terms of targets? We're going to be focused on uh, the, the Patterson Corridor that hosts Arrow. Uh, we're also going to be focused on the Dirksen Corridor, which is directly parallel to the Patterson Lake Corridor. It's actually the one which we ranked the number one prospectivity when we acquired the projects in, in the first, uh, 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 when we first acquired the projects. Um, we're also gonna be on SW1 along the corridor that um, uh, uh, F3's recent discovery was, um, was uh, highlighted on. So, um, you know, high torque exploration. Uh, is is what we're doing with this program in 2023. Lee, a big part of the next gen story has been one of de-risking, and this includes getting all relevant permits. What permits will you prioritize in 2023? We had we had we had our we submitted our environmental impact study in June of uh, 2022, and uh, we've subsequently had the federal. 90-day uh, public comment period. All public comments came in. We're very pleased 
with those comments that came in. Uh, it demonstrated that our EIS was very descriptive and transparent with respects to all um, aspects of the project. Uh, we are working through those comments as we speak. We are also working parallel because with respect to uranium, it requires a provincial permit plus the federal permit. Uh, provincially, we are very, very close to finalising the EIS um, based on the technical review and the uh, of the EIS by the Minister of Environment. Um, so our focus will be this year receiving the uh, provincial approval of our uh, project and also the federal approval shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, look, we, we I was in Ottawa just uh, seven days ago um, meeting with the ministers and the CNSC and uh, I, I really do have to commend the the um, uh, approach by both the, the federal government and its CNSC with respect to the permitting of our project. You would have heard the, the, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister um, and a number of the ministers uh, federally talk about friendshoring the expedited development of resource projects for critical minerals. And whilst whilst uranium is not described as a critical mineral, it's an absolutely critical fuel. Um, and uh, and uh, we're certainly in that range and that uh, view of the federal government and the provincial government with respect to just how material next gen is in terms of addressing energy, um, first of all, and decarbonised energy and energy equality, equality um, for the globe. So it's, look, I say it all the time, it's an absolute privilege and uh, the whole team at NextGen is, is incredibly, feels incredibly privileged to be working on such a project that has such worldwide ramifications. Um, but uh, I, I tell you the dedication and the examples I see every day from the team of that commitment and ownership of that responsibility is, is uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud to be the CEO. I'm surprised uranium is not classified as a critical mineral. I think it's, it's just a definition thing. Um, but um, uh, there's no doubt with the European Union classifying nuclear as clean, green and safe, um, uh, the UK uh, also offering um, investment incentives um, towards investments in nuclear energy and the production of the fuel, the US is doing the same. It, the reality is it is considered a, uh, a critical mineral which is classified as green. I want to move on to your balance sheet now, just briefly, but just touch on how much cash you have on hand. And you also announced recently the initiation of an ATM for $250 million. I'm curious what you will be using those funds for. Yeah, we we finished 2022. The financials are going to be coming out shortly, but I've, I've been very clear with my forecast. We're going to end the year with about $100 million uh, in the uh, Treasury that's well fund that funds us very well for all the remaining permitting um, activities and the detailed engineering that we're in the um, process of finalizing. And uh, the ATM, the movement behind that is to just have that in place in order to optimize financing financing um, opportunities. Um, whether we use it or not remains to be determined. Um, as you know, we our capital raisings in the past have been very strategic in nature, um, CEF being one of them. Uh, I, I would say that what we're looking at to finance the balance of the project through the cash flow is a combination of debt and equity. Um, obviously, the superior economics of the project means that it can serve us a large proponent of debt, um, but there will be an equity component as well. And having the ATM in place gives us the opportunity to see the best equity package we can over that period between now and positive cash flow. Any equity we do raise, look, 
we the 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 project at fifty dollars a pound will be returning over a billion dollars a year and after tax cash flow we will be paying that equity back so if any investors you know and and they rightfully should should be focused on dilution um they can be rest assured that this will be a very very uh undiluted financing package between now and cash flow Lee, as we wrap up, you have outlined many of your objectives for the coming year, but maybe you can just summarize what investors can expect in terms of news flow in the coming months. Yeah, a lot of news flow uh, around as we work through the remaining stages of the permitting uh, expiration. The drill rigs are, run, are, are turning. Like uh, you know, the the opportunity for a discovery is all, always very very high. Uh, and then uh, the engineering aspects as well, um, and and uh, uh, the engineering aspects, and also um, there's a number of community events which we have on the horizon. Um, training programs we're already in in training mode, um, running training courses in the communities in which the project's located, and uh, you're going to see very strong validation of those those programs and the next gen's approach. Um, to the community um, over the course of this year. And that doesn't stop. Um, we're basically just elevating and elevating as we go uh, through every year. And uh, uh, the size, the scale, the number of people that the, the company positively impacts is growing by magnitude as this project develops. And, and that's, you know, that's also very much realised by the government both provincially and, and federally, that this project is a very positive story impacting many, many people positively in the community, in the province, in the country and worldwide. And, um, and as we progress, the magnitude of those people we positively impact grows uh, exponentially. Well, that was a great overview and a great update on Next Gen Energy, Lee. And I want to thank you for making time with us today. And Enjoy yourself in Australia. Absolutely. Well, I'm uh, due to catch a flight in just uh, three days from now. So uh, I'll be back over there and see you before you know it, Jimmy. And absolute pleasure being on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Did you know that 80% of our viewers are not subscribers to our channel? So be sure to subscribe to the channel and help us put some food on the table. Hi, John. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Wyoming? Hey, doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's good to catch up again. John, UR Energy is unique for a couple of reasons. First, it's located in the state of Wyoming, and second, it uses the ISR production method to extract uranium. ISR is much different from traditional hard rock mining. And before we begin with an overview of your company, why don't we just start with a brief explanation of ISR mining and what are the benefits associated with it? Yeah, you bet. In situ, uh, it's such a unique process. It's been around since the early 1960s. In fact, it was kind of pioneered at our Shirley Basin project here in Wyoming. We believe that was the first in situ mine for uranium in the world. But it offers a number of advantages over conventional mining. Uh, first off, the capital expenditure for in situ is very low uh, compared to conventional. Uh, when we build out our Shirley Basin facility, which will be ISR, uh, the cost to build out the plant and the first mine unit, we're looking at about a $30 million expenditure. That's nothing compared to what you would have to pay for a conventional, where you would be looking in several hundred million dollars to build that out. 
uh, but also very importantly, you can address very low grades with in situ mining at a very low cost. So in Wyoming, not just our company, but other companies as well, when we apply that technology, we can recover grades down to you know, 0.04% at a uh, operating cost that is very similar to what you're gonna see in the Athabasca, where they're recovering grades of you know, 10 to 15%. That's amazing, several orders of magnitude different in head grade, but yet we can still compete with that uh, because of the technology. But also the environmental footprint with in situ is really small. Uh, we simply install water wells. We don't have open pits or underground workings or tailings. And when we get done mining, we clean up the groundwater, we take the well heads out, and when we're gone, you can't even tell we were ever there. The, the ground can be returned back to its uh, pre-use. So a lot of advantages to in situ. It can't be used for all uh, host rock types. It's fairly well restricted to just sandstone, so it does have that limitation. But if you've got a good sandstone uh, hosted ore body, it's a great technology. That was a great overview. Let's move on now. The U.S. is the largest nuclear energy producer in the world. 20% of its electricity comes from nuclear. However, the U.S. imports most, if not all, of its uranium, approximately 50 million pounds a year. UR Energy will be one of the few producers in the U.S with its Lost Creek and Shirley Basin assets. And I wanna get a better understanding of both assets and where they are just in terms of production and also the economics behind each asset. Lost Creek is the largest of the two and the most advanced. So why don't we just start there? Can you just provide us with a brief overview of this asset? How many pounds are there and what is the grade? Yeah, so Lost Creek, we started production there in 2013. Uh, we've produced nearly 3 million pounds since then. The last few years, we've allowed production to decline because the market has been depressed. But we've been working to layer in contracts. And in uh, December of last year, we announced the decision that we're going to ramp up production. So right now, we are focused on drilling, constructing, and we're literally within a few weeks of having significant flow and production through the uh, processing plant there. So it's an established mine. Uh, fully licensed, permitted, uh, everything's constructed. We just need to simply advance it. The resource in the ground at Lost Creek, 11.9 million pounds of measured and indicated resources, another 6.6 .6 million pounds of inferred. Uh, the grade is about 0.05%. Uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, the grades can be low with in situ and it's still very profitable. So in the past at Lost Creek, our C1 cash cost We've been down in the low $16 range. Uh, we believe we can get back close to that. Uh, because of inflation, we're not gonna get right down to that exactly uh, going forward, but we believe we can get close to that. And the all-in cost for the mine site, uh, historically, we've been uh, right around $33. Again, we can't get right back to that, but we believe we can get very close to that going forward. So a very good low-cost producer, uh, technically very strong. We've had great recoveries, about 90% on average over the life of the mine, which is uh, pretty much setting the standard for the industry. So we're excited to get that property back up and running. And what is the mine life? We are looking at a 14-year mine life with the known resources. Uh, but we have a lot of opportunity at Lost Creek to explore. We have 35,000 acres of BLM and state uh, land that we work on. And uh, if you take a look at our technical report, you'll see that there are a lot of redox fronts with, that are mineralized, that we know they're there, but we've not chased them to their end. So tremendous opportunity for growth in that resource. We've done a total of six exploration projects on that uh, asset. Every time we've done exploration, we've been successful at finding more pounds. And our discovery cost on that particular property has been about 50 cents a pound. So we'll get back to exploration uh, one of these days after we get ramped up. But for not right now, we're relying on that 14 year mine life uh, to get things up and running. And in terms of production, what are you currently producing? And maybe you can give us a little more detail associated with this ramp up. When you are fully up and running, how many pounds will you be producing annually? Yeah, so right now our production is very, very low. It's negligible. Uh, we've never shut down. We've continued to flow and produce, but it's uh, insignificant. Uh, this year, this calendar year, by the end of this year, we uh, hope to have put between 200 and 300,000 pounds in the can. That'll be sufficient to satisfy our contract for this year. The contract book next year goes up to 600,000 pounds. 
So we'll produce between six and 800,000 pounds next year to fill those contracts. So uh, that's uh, what we're looking forward to as we ramp up and uh, getting production going. So the decision to ramp up is just based on contracting? It is, you know, we're a pretty conservatively run company. We typically don't like to sell into the spot market because it's too ephemeral. Uh, it's high prices today, low prices tomorrow, depending on what Sprott and others are doing with that market. So really we prefer to uh, sign it up and layer in long-term contracts with stable utilities and use that as justification to put the capital in the ground to ramp up production. So yeah, our decisions on ramp up are really predicated on our ability to do contracting and we are working now to layer in additional contracts for the years going forward. But John, given the economics behind uranium and, and given this backdrop, it looks so positive and, and I think we can safely assume the price is going to be significantly higher next year and in the ensuing years. Why not just produce and, and keep it in inventory until we get higher prices? Yeah, so there's a real cost to producing and capital is precious, especially we don't know where the broader market is going to go. Uh, most people are calling for a recession. And so if we take our precious capital, we put it into the ground now and say we produce 500,000 pounds this year with the hopes of selling it next year, uh, we don't know for sure where that market's going to go. And if we put all of our capital in the ground, we can go broke that way. And so it's just not a, a, a path we want to take. But by ramping up and selling into contracts, we still have a lot of capacity at Lost Creek. And uh, once we have all the employees hired, we have all the rigs on site, the contractors on site. We've got significant flow, ramping it up above our contract level so that we can sell into spot. That becomes easy at that point. And so that's the position we're trying to put ourselves is we have that good base revenue from contracts that justifies putting the capital in the ground. And if the conditions warrant, spot market goes higher, then we can ramp up very quickly to sell into the spot. So you just touched on capacity. Why don't we discuss that? What is the, what licenses do you have? How much can you produce annually? And also tell us about the processing plan. How many, how much can you process given the permits? Yeah, we are fully permitted at Lost Creek. The plant is fully built out. The well field or the mine portion of it, it's licensed at 1.2 million pounds per year. And the processing plant is licensed at 2.2 million pounds per year. The difference between the two, the Delta is intentional. And it's because we would like to be able to bring in material from our other facility, Shirley Basin or others in the future, and process it at the Lost Creek processing plant. So that gives us some room to bring in and toll process for our other properties, but also for competitors that are working in the area. And so it takes us up to 2.2 million pounds per year. And you brought up the fact that there are competitors in the area. Has anybody approached you about using your facilities? We haven't had any serious conversations yet. Uh, we've had some conversations more in passing, uh, but I think as competitors develop properties in the area, we're the logical place to take those pounds, uh, both within the Great Divide Basin and also in Shirley Basin, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, there are a number of small uh, projects that are owned by competitors. They're small enough that they are worth chasing, but they're not big enough to uh, justify a full processing plant. So since we're going to have the processing plant there, it would only make sense for them to put in a small in situ facility and either pipeline directly to us or put in a small satellite and bring the resin over to us. So we expect we'll have more conversations on total processing going forward. Okay, so that's a good segue into Shirley Basin. Why don't we just start off with a brief overview of this asset, how many pounds there are, and, and what is the grade at Shirley Basin? So the grade at Shirley Basin is very good. We're looking at nearly a quarter of a percent, which is a very good high grade for in situ mining. Uh, the resource there is 100% measured and indicated. So that has been completely drilled out, 8.8 uh, .8 million pounds total. Uh, not a massive project, we recognize that. But the reason we acquired the project is simply because of the quality. It's very shallow. The grades are very good. It's completely drilled out and defined. We have all of the historic records. The roads are there, power lines are there, uh, even some of the buildings are there. So we believe the cost of production at that uh, particular plant uh, is gonna be actually lower than at Lost Creek. 
And so as far as licensing goes, we have all of the major licenses and permits in hand, and we're waiting to make a decision to uh, build out that facility as we layer in additional contracts for sales. And again, much like Lost Creek, we're not gonna put the capital in the ground until we have line of sight on revenue from that property. So we're working on contracting and layering that in. Once we have sufficient contracts in hand, we'd like to have at least 400, 500,000 pounds under contract for Shirley. But once we have that, we'll make the go decision. And you know, building out that facility, it, because it's a satellite, it's not a full plant, we can build it out very, very quickly. Uh, probably on the order of 18 months to completely build it out and ramp it up. In the capital cost, we're looking at probably around $30 million. We've got some inflationary pressures on that number, so we'll probably go a little above 30 million. Uh, but again, the capital expenditure on that is pretty minimal. And John, when both Lost Creek and Shirley Basin are up and running at full capacity, what will be the annual production? So again, at the, the well field at Lost Creek, capacity there is 1.2 million. The capacity at uh, Shirley is 1 million pounds from the well field or the mine. So total capacity of 2.2 million pounds a year. And we would like to push that. Uh, we're not gonna just give up those pounds for free or break even. We want very good profit margins on an all in basis. And, but we would love to get it up to the 2.2 million pound a year run rate. And, also would like to start toll processing for competitors. And that would allow us to take our capacity up to 4.2 million pounds per year, which is a very meaningful number and uh, would start to put us in the mid tier uh, for production. And again, Lost Creek's built out. Shirley Basin is fully licensed and permitted. It can be built out very quickly. So uh, it's very plausible that within two years, we could be at a 4 million pound rate uh, coming from the plant side of things. I want to move on now and discuss your contracting book. You you mentioned earlier that you have 600,000 pounds under contract. Maybe you can give us a little bit of color on that. What are the terms associated with that? And is it all with U.S. utilities? Yeah, so we have non-disclosure agreements with the, the, the companies we've contracted with. So I have to be careful what I say there. Uh, but I will say we've contracted with some of the largest uh, nuclear companies uh, globally. Uh, we've gotten exceptionally good pricing on those contracts. Uh, they are very profitable on an all-in basis. And when I say all-in, I don't mean just to cover the mine side. I mean keeping the lights on in this office, uh, corporate GNA, and on an all-in basis, we are very profitable on those contracts. And those are the kind of contracts that we look to sign up uh, going forward. We believe we're getting a premium above the spot and above the long-term price because Lost Creek is a very well-known entity. It's a proven producer in a safe jurisdiction here in the US. There are no transportation issues like out of Kazakhstan. There are no geopolitical issues like out of Russia. So we believe over time, utilities are gonna be looking more and more toward US supply, and they're gonna be willing to pay a little bit more for that supply uh, because of its security. So we're very happy with the pricing and would love to sign up additional contracts going forward at that pricing. For this calendar year, 2023, we have 200,000 pounds under contract, uh, has a flex of 10%, uh, but starting next year, 2024, and for about six years thereafter, uh, we've got 600,000 pounds under contract, and we're in continual discussions with utilities toward layering in additional sales contracts. And let's move on now and, and just touch on the Uranium Reserve Fund. You, UR Energy did sell into the uranium reserve fund maybe you can provide some details on that how many pounds did you sell and at what price yeah so for clarity the 600,000 pounds of contracting that i just talked about does not include uh, the contract that we have with the department of energy so uh, literally just a few weeks ago uh, we won a contract with the department of energy to sell into the uranium reserve we bid a hundred thousand pounds uh, into that program and uh, we sold it to doe at $64.47 a pound. Those pounds have now been delivered to the Department of Energy, and we're expecting the payment on that uh, within a few days now. So we're gonna bring in a little over $6.4 million into the coffers from that. The total program that Congress allocated funds for was $75 million. Uh, that's a good start, but really there needs to be more done. The uh, Nuclear Fuel Working Group had suggested or recommended to Congress that it'd be $150 million a year 
for 10 years, uh, each year, 150 million for 10 years. So a little over a billion dollars. Uh, unfortunately, Congress didn't see fit to approve that. They did a one-time program of 75 million, but there is ongoing discussion within Congress on what can be done to further incentivize the front end of the fuel cycle, mining, conversion, and enrichment. So we'll see where those discussions go. Uh, as a company, it's always been our mandate to sell uranium to utilities and be profitable doing that. We have never made it a practice to rely on the federal government for handouts. Uh, so really that's not our focus. However, when the US government comes along and wants to sign a contract with us, we'll certainly talk with them, especially if it's a high price contract. But really our mandate is low cost production so that we can sell to uh, US and global utilities at good profit margins. And that, that's really what we uh, spend our time working on. And you also are sitting on 224,000 pounds of uranium in inventory. What are your intentions with that? So when the Department of Energy came out with the RFP, uh, we debated whether or not to sell all of that because it's all US produced. Those 224,000 pounds, we produced those. We didn't go out and buy them. Uh, we're a producer. Uh, so we thought, you know, should we sell those to DOE or make an attempt to, or do we hold them? We made the decision to hold back on that, not bid it into DOE, so that we would have some uh, feedstock uh, as we ramp up production. If we run into any technical problems, we would have that uh, in our bank account essentially uh, to feed into that contract for this year. So that's our intent to hold on to it for now. Uh, as we get ramped up and uh, the pounds start to flow, we may make a decision to sell that into the spot market or we may sell it into higher priced contracts. But for now, we're just going to hang on to it and we'll see where the market goes and we'll see how production comes along. John, I want to move the conversation toward valuation now. UR Energy has a lot going for it. It's cashed up. It's sitting on over 200,000 pounds of uranium in inventory. You're ramping up production. You're one of the only producers, if not the only producer of uranium in the U.S., but yet you're trading at a discount. What are you and your team going to do to close this valuation gap? No, I appreciate that question. I get asked that a good bit. I guess maybe a, first of all, a, a comment on valuations. Uh, I think uh, as we look at valuations, it shouldn't be simply dividing pounds into a market cap. That's not the whole story. There's a lot more that needs to be looked at. Um, and I'm not going to name any names, but there are certain companies out there that have assets that are probably uh, require another five to fifteen dollars a pound in the market before they even reach break even. And so it's not really fair to say divide those pounds into market cap and say that's the valuation because it's probably years, maybe even decades before those pounds come to market. Uh, that's not true for, for us. At UR Energy, when we've made acquisition, we, it's only been for pounds that we can produce. So at Lost Creek and at Shirley Basin, those are producible pounds at today's market. And so I think it's fair to divide that into market cap to get a valuation. But investors should be very careful about dividing pounds into market cap. There, there needs to be a quality factor that's put into that. Our pounds are producible. They've been proven to be economic and profitable in the very uh, recent past. And so that's got to be a, a part of the discussion. But to more directly answer your question, what are we doing? We're going to do what we said we're going to do. We're going to go into production. We're going to keep our cost very low. We're going to compete with uh, pretty much anybody globally, maybe perhaps Kazakhstan being the exception to that. But we're going to compete with Canada. We're going to compete with Australia. And we're going to be in the lowest quartile uh, on cost production, especially when you look at publicly traded companies. That's where we want to be. We've said we're going to do that. We've done it in the past. We're going to get back to that with meaningful production here in the U.S. Uh, we're also going to continue to work on research and development uh, with a goal in mind. Number one, to be sustainable, reduce our footprint. But number two, we're going to drive down our cost through that research and development. And we've got some exciting programs going on there uh, with regard to well casing and well installation methodologies and also with regard to wastewater treatment. Both of those, if we're successful on those, will drive down our cost in the long term and make us even more competitive on the global scene. But uh, that's our focus. We want to be a low cost producer, and that's how we're trying to add value to the company, a legitimate value story. That's a great wrap up. But before I let you go, why don't you just tell us what investors can expect in terms of news flow in the coming months from UR Energy? 
So wrapping up production, we'll keep the public appraised of that as we get flow through the plant at a meaningful rate. And as we fill contracts, we'll keep up uh, the public on that. I uh, also just mentioned research and development. Uh, we've had a slight pause in some of that uh, as we are focused on ramp up right now, but within a few weeks, we'll get back to that. And we hope to have a lot more to share on that uh, in the very near future. Beyond that, contracting. Uh, we're in continual discussions with utilities on bringing in additional, very good, profitable contracts. And as we're able to sign more of those up, uh, we'll let the public know. And our objective is to ultimately get enough signed up that we can make the go decision on Shirley Basin and get production up to uh, 2.2 million pounds per year. So that's the news flow uh, going forward and that's our objective. Well, that was a great overview and a great update on UR Energy. I wanna thank you for making time with us today, John, and we look forward to the future updates. All right, thank you. Hi, Mike. Thanks very much for joining us today. How are things in New York? Uh, they're good, Jimmy. Thanks for having me. Mike, I'm looking forward to this discussion, but before we examine the nuclear industry in detail, why don't we just start with a brief overview of your firm, Sachem Co. Partners. Where is the firm based and also what is the firm's mandate? Sure. Sachem Co. We're based in Long Island, New York. We're about 45 minutes east of New York City. Um, we uh, are an affiliate of Lloyd Harbor Capital Management. Uh, so um, we are, our mandate, we have a couple of mandates. One, one is we have one fund that runs about close to $200 million that invests just in the uranium trade. And then uh, we have another one that invests in other natural resources. Um, so, which is around a hundred uh, million. So a little, uh, a shy drop of 300 million in assets under management um, for the last uh, since really have done a deep dive in the nuclear power uranium space since 2015-16, um, started our fund in May of 2018. And do you look at any other resources besides uranium? We do some, yeah. We we look at other resources in our in our other vehicle. Um, uh, we do uh, across the across the spectrum of resources. Uh, we we like to see where capital has been underinvested over a period of years. Uh, and we think that that often leads to uh, similar to uranium. When 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 everyone leaves the building and nobody's really interested, that's where you can find some opportunities. Well, given that you and your team spend most of your time on uranium, this is where I want to take our discussion. And I sure. want to start with a top-down approach, uh, beginning with supply and demand, just to frame how compelling this trade is. So why don't we just start right there? What is the annual supply and demand? And, and we'll take it from there. Sure, Jimmy. So <clears throat> we're coming out of a period of, of excess supply for a number of years. Uh, those of your listeners who aren't familiar with uh, the Fukushima nuclear event in March of 2011, at the time, Japan was 13% uh, of, of global nuclear power demand. So it was very large. It had 54 reactors. And when uh, the tsunami uh, caused a tidal wave that breached the seawall and it caused uh, the meltdown, at Fukushima. Over the next few years, we basically saw all the reactors in Japan go offline. And as you can imagine, uh, the, the supply chains are a couple of years. It could take for the nuclear fuel cycle. It's not just uranium into a reactor. It goes through many stages. You get a backup and you wind up with excess supply. You have orders being taken that may not be being used. You had um, a whole se next several years, there was fear in the marketplace. Uh, some countries were reducing their dependency on nuclear power, uh, France, uh, South Korea, Japan, obviously, uh, parts of the, uh, some, some U.S. reactors were, were, were closing, um, the U.K., the same situation. 
uh, Germany had decided to, they had already started to wean themselves off, but they were a major power at one, nuclear power producer at one time. So that period of you know, 2012 through 2017 was 2018-ish, but 2017, it really was a period where there was a lot of uncertainty. So you had a nuclear fuel buyers certainly weren't in the mood to step up and recommit to lots of long-term contracts. And the, the market has been defined over cycles, you know, 80 to 85 percent of what gets bought gets bought under long term contracts, seven, eight, nine, 10 plus years, simply because there's no substitute for uranium. You can't gas to, to coal switch uh, when you have a nuclear reactor. So but that that changed and there was a surplus in the market for a number of years. You were looking at um, if I look at just let's use UXC as the, the bellwether. Um, uh, industry consultant that puts forecasts and price reporting out there. Um, you know, they, they would show you over, th there was about 165-ish million pounds per year consumed uh, from 2015, 16 through 2022, on average about that. But what you, uh, and then you saw mine supply of about 140 million pounds on average during that period. Uh, and, and when I say the demand, by the way, the number, that's for uranium requirements. I'm not talking if there was any inventory builds, any utilities adding some for inventory or anything else. That's pure requirements. And, and, and we'll talk in a minute, requirements are requirements because that impacts supply and demand. But, um, and you were looking at about 140 million pounds of primary production, but you saw 60 million pounds of secondary supply come into the market. And that came into the market in the form of, uh, uh, re-enriched tails, uh, MOX, which is another type of fuel, uh, but huge inventory drawdowns because inventories were backing up in the system. So utilities, rather than going out and replenishing their supply, for context, utilities since 2012 have been replacing their annual consumption at a rate of just under 40%. So every pound consumed, they're not replacing it with long-term contracts. Why? They were drawing down inventories. They were drawing down on average 25 million pounds per annum of inventories. Of that 60 million pounds, 25 on average was coming from inventory drawdowns. So you had an excess supply in the market of 30, 35 ish million pounds that had to be chewed through, right? So, and, and the market bottomed in November of 16, and the price of uranium was about $18 per pound. Uh, and then what you saw was uh, a period of the market just healing itself. And now you've gone from 18 in the spot market to 52, 51, 52 in the spot market. And um, inventories have come down tremendously. Uh, and so you are now in a period of time where 2017 marked the bottom of nuclear sentiment. Fast forward to 2022, 2023, and the nuclear sentiment has done a 180, especially from a demand standpoint. All the countries I mentioned before, let's use France as an example, 75% of their power, uh, electricity is generated by nuclear power. After Macron took office in 2017, the French energy minister came out and declared they were going to go to 50%. They were going to close a number of reactors. Fast forward to today. The reality of what they just have to look next door to their neighbor, Germany who's tried to wean themselves off. CO2, CO2 emissions are up, costs are materially higher, and they want to have importing some nuclear power from France. So they don't want to replicate that. So not only have they said we, we won't go down to 50%, but our 75% number is going to stay, and we're going to build 14 new reactors along the way uh, by the 2030s. You've seen that in the UK, you've seen that uh, in Japan now is, is restarting. They put all reactors to life extensions of 60 years. Uh, and and there, there's a major push to get them going. South Korea did a complete 180. When uh, President Moon was elected, uh, he had wanted to phase out nuclear power. He showed up to shut down the reactors uh, uh, over a period of time. New reactors under construction stop. That's changed. So what does that mean? If we look at uh, UXC's estimate of demand, from 2023 through 2030. And I, when I, again, when I say demand, I'm just talking reactor requirements. Uh, we're looking at around uh, 200 million pounds per annum, up from the 165 that it was. 
And that's where it's really important though, Jimmy, to when we talk about supply and demand, the demand side of the equation is really important to understand nuclear mass and how a pound of uranium today to feed a reactor might not be worth the same pound of your, and I don't mean in price, I mean in the amount of uranium needed at another time. And it all is driven by the amount of enrichment capacity that exists in the world. The enrichment capacity is, it drives to a, to a certain extent, but it could be the di difference between 10 to 20% of annual uranium requirements. So when, when the enrichers have a lot of excess capacity in the market, uh, you have, think of uh, an enricher, they, they, it's, it's a combination of force and feed. Not all pounds are created equal. It all depends on your enrichment capacity. And without getting into the details, at the, at the enrichment plants, they can enrich different amounts uh, of uranium. They could use different amounts of uranium to, to, to meet the world's reactor requirements. And it all depends on the amount of capacity. When there's too much capacity, they don't need as, many, uh, as much uranium uh, to make the same amount of enriched uranium product. When there's too little capacity, that's called underfeeding, by the way. When there's too little capacity, uh, they need more uranium to make the, enough enriched uranium to feed the world's reactors. It's just the way the enrichment market works. During the period of 2012 through 2021-ish, 2020, the, the world's enrichment plants were extracting about 20 to 25 million pounds a year in excess uranium called underfeeding that they were able to sell into the market. So it was the equivalent of having the world's largest mine being sold into the market during a period where for many of those years, demand was down. Now you fast forward to today, just like in many industries across the natural resource sector, there's been a tremendous amount of underinvestment. There's been underinvestment in, in mining, there's been underinvestment in uranium conversion, there's been underinvestment in uranium enrichment. And so when the centrifuges have worn out, they're not being replaced at the same clip that they normally would. And so this lack of investment has led to a lack of available supply. And what is happening there? Why? Because in February 24th, the Russians invaded Ukraine, and the Russians control almost 40% of the enrichment market. The Russians control all 27% of the conversion market. The Russians control 14% of the uranium market. And so, but at the enrichment plant, what you're starting to see is the Western uh, consumers, the United States, which gets 25% of its enriched uranium from Russia, Western Europe, 30%. They're starting to look at alternative plants, self-sanctioning, if you will. And so when that happens, they need to turn to the couple of Western enrichers, Orano or Urenco, but there's only a, f a couple of them. And so what winds up happening is that capacity at those enrichers gets really tight. And as you look forward in the world, as I said a few minutes earlier, tight capacity means you need more uranium to enrich for the same amount of reactors or for a, a certain amount of reactors. To put it in context, Jimmy, when uh, it, uranium enrichment is used, they, they use something called tails. And it's just think of a waste stream. Um, as enrichment gets, as capacity gets tighter, they're going to use higher tails. You can use, yeah, they could consume, if they went to, let's say, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 tails, that, that might be, you might need in that 20% more uranium to enrich. So the world's reactor requirements could be as much as that much higher. Conversely, over the last several years, it could go down a lot. So as I look at, and my team and I look at supply and demand, we can't just say there's X number of reactors. Each reactor consumes X number of pounds, uh, and that's how much you're going to be, because it doesn't work that way. It's so dependent on the fuel cycle. It's so dependent on, on the enrichment capacity. And so when we look at that, and you know, if, if UXC is using 200 million, uh, pounds roughly from 2023 through 2030 for their uranium requirements without any inventory building. That's just plain requirements is what they're looking at. We're north of that. You know, we 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 could push up to 215, 220 in that ballpark, right? 
Um, and it all depends on the tails you're using and the capacities that you're assuming. Um, and then when you look at the inventories, they've been drawn down tremendously. And so uh, it, that, that uh, 60 million pounds of secondary supply that was coming into the market, 25 million pounds of, of which were inventory drawdowns, 25 million pounds of which were, were uh, 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 underfeeding coming into the market. The underfeeding we think goes away. So that's 20 to 25 million pounds that is not there. We're being replaced by over the next couple of years, you start to see overfeeding occurring. And that's when the enrichment contracts start to start to wean themselves off and you get a new round of uh, heavy contracting taking place. You start to plan for the future. And that's where overfeeding occurs. That's where the delta, the swing between the 20 million pounds of excess uh, from, from the underfeeding can turn into 20, 25 million pounds of more uranium that needs to be purchased by the enrichers. And so when you look at, for instance, Urenco's inventory of, of, of raw materials, it's it's gone down, it's 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 fallen off a cliff over the last several years. Well, now when that happens, they need to start to go out and restock. So as we look at supply demand, if, if and again, these are well, we we're not held to forecast. It's hard to forecast, right? But if you're law, if you're if you're use UXC's numbers of 200 million pounds, um, the the primary mine production has been um, challenging. Uh, you know, one of the things, Jimmy, if you look out there, and if you were to say all state-owned pounds on a supply side were 110, 120 million pounds, that's all state-owned. That they're, they're not all low cost pounds. The Chinese pounds are extremely high cost, right? So the, the 15 million pounds that they do in Namibia, very high cost. There are 4 million pounds they do in China, really high cost. But, but when we look at everyone seems to look at Kazakhstan and everyone seems to think that Kazakhstan can solve the world's uranium problems. Somebody told me recently about an interview where somebody was saying that they were told that hundred, if, if, if Kazakhstan had a hundred million dollars, they could, they could pump as much uranium as they want out there. So that's, that's such, so ridiculous. It's, it's so absurd. Kazakhstan since 2014 has spent $1 billion in capital expenditures. They spent 208 million last year. They, uh, 190 the year before. By the way, they've not been able to meet their production levels the last few years. It's a challenge for them. And they're running at 10 to 20% below what their targets are. And, and, and much of that is they chose to do that, but as they want to ramp, they can't just ramp like that. That's one of the biggest misnomers in the market is that the Kazakhs could turn the switch and there it goes. That's trading off of stale information or that's trading off of not really doing the amount of depth of work that you might want to do on that. So, so as we look at the supply, I say, okay, 110, 120 million pounds of state owned. Well, in theory, any, anyone can, they state owned, people can sell it for a buck, they won't. If we look at before the supply cuts started coming 2017, 2018, which is equal 25% of world supply, uh, about 70% of state owned pounds were being produced because prices were too low. So, but even if you took the 110 million pounds at face value, once you pass that, Jimmy, you then need to start producing for people who are seeking profit. They're profit-seeking enterprises. And in the world of uranium, they're pure plays. It's not Rio Tinto that could spread their costs all over the place or Glencore. Or That's not how it works. So now you need to start to get into the productive economics. Secondary supply from the from Post Fukushima, that that hangover is is pretty much worked down. Inventory drawdowns have pretty much been exhausted. Uh, there's no programs out there like there were in from 1993 to 2013, where they were able to take Russian down blended uranium at 20 million pounds a year. You're you're getting to the bare bones. So now, how much production is out there? You know, I mean, could you produce? Uh, 100, uh, that 110, 120, now you, you what, what did we say earlier? 200 million pounds of, of demand. Now what we're not including in that, those are reactor requirements, Jimmy. What's not being included is a couple of things. And I think people might not appreciate this, is if we look back at last cycle, from 1993 to 2004, utilities contracted at 40% of annual consumption. When they started then the contract, because inventories were low, and they started the contract, they contracted at 110 to 140% of 
annual consumption. So if we look at reactor grill requirements and we use UXC's numbers, which we think are light at 200 million, right? That two, it's gotta be 200 million times XY because they've only been contracting at 40% of annual consumption since 2012. They have a ton of catching up to do. So put a multiple on that. You wanna put 1.1, 1.2 of that 200 million. Now then add in the fact that they need to restock their inventories. They've been under purchasing. So now you get, right, that restocking comes as part of that over contracting, but you'll see them in the spot market and then you got the financial buyers. So you're well into the, you know, 215, 220, pick a number, 225. When you look at the, the the world supply, you know you're looking at maybe if if everything was cranking and running and 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 you're sitting there at, at much higher prices, one one fifty five, one sixty, one sixty five, one seventy. Your secondary supplies you're looking at fifteen twenty million pounds maybe. Um, so now you're you got to bridge that gap. Pick in the pick of different forecasters number, 20 million pounds, 15 million pounds, 25 million pounds per annum. So you're looking at a, a, a big number between what the period we just came through. And the last thing I'll say on supply and demand is I mentioned that in the last cycle, 1993 to 2004, contracting was very low as a percent, and then it went crazy. And what happened? From 2000 to 2004, the price of uranium was bottomed at $7 in December of 00, roughly. Seven to 10 to 12 to 15. By the, by the time 2005 came around, you, you went from contracting 70 million a year before to 240 million in 2005. And uh, during that time period, if I were, uh, the, the next year came and oftentimes the world Today, who the five people in the world who care about uranium, but they look at the last cycle and say, well, the last cycle started because Cigar Lake Mine, the biggest mine in the world, was scheduled to come online and it flooded. So the true statement part of that was the Cigar Lake Mine flooded. All the other stuff is BS because the Cigar Lake Mine flooded, the big flood in October of 06. By that time, the price of uranium had gone from seven and 00 to by the time oh contracting started in 05, you're talking it was in the 40s, so it had already climbed 6x. Contracting started, and by the time the Cigar Lake flood came around, uranium's in the 50s. Uh, but if I were a fuel buyer back then and I was looking at my supply demand, and they buy out six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, but if I said let's let's look out six years forward, what's the surplus demand or deficit in the market? They would have seen a surplus before the flood of 125 million pounds looking six years out. Now, fast forward, the flood comes in October of 06. By the first quarter of 07, you know that there is not um, uh, that mine coming online for a long time. What does the sur surplus deficit look like over the next six years? Over 200 million pounds. The forecasters at the time added some more mine supply, they reduced demand a little bit, but there was never a deficit. And the price of uranium went from 50-ish to $137 a pound. And all it needed to go was in the 60s, but it went nuts. Why? Because you had 15 years or so of under contracting, you had complacency, you had just, there's always enough inventory out there, nobody thought about anything, and then just stuff happens. And when supplies are tight, that happens. Fast forward to today, I talked about demand, mine supply, secondary supply, underfeeding to overfeeding. If I look at the most conservative of the surpluses that you, let's use UXCs from 2023 through 2030, by putting all their math together, it would suggest that there's um, 50, 60 million pounds of a deficit um, over those years. We think that's conservative by uh, a few hundred million pounds, but, but it's showing deficits versus surpluses last time. And when fuel and and the difference now versus then is back then, I mentioned earlier the Russian down blended uranium. That was a program called megatons to megawatts, 1993 to 2013. I'm a US fuel buyer. It was between the Russian government and the American government. They wanted down blend intercontinental ballistic nuclear missiles to make sure that it didn't wind up in the in, in the black market off in, in nowhere because Russia was broke. 
right, the wall fell in 92, they were worried those bombs would make their way out to, into the black market. So we took 500 metric tons of downblended uranium, about 20 million pounds per annum from 93 to 2013. As a fuel buyer, you, that's an off-balance sheet asset for you because you don't have to take it into inventory. It's coming in. You'll get your, your portion of it. It's coming in. That doesn't exist today. Inventories have been drawn down. There's no programs like that. There's no underfeeding. Urenco's not showing up at your door saying, hey, you want to buy some excess uranium? That doesn't exist. But what, what's the similarity to last cycle? You've got a cohort of fuel buyers. You've got a cohort of traders. You've got a cohort of people in the marketplace who believe the, the stale narrative. And so we think there's big deficits in the market and we think that's uh, that's uh, sets up for nice nice price appreciation. And by the way, I've heard somebody say, oh, the price of uranium has only gone up to $50. Really, it was 17. So you tell me how when there's excess in the market, the price triples, how's that work? If there was, so um, yeah, I, I just think that so from a supply and demand standpoint, we're, we're pretty pleased with how the setup is. Mike, you raised some very interesting points there about supply and demand, and, and you did touch on this. A big part of supply and demand is geopolitics. And with the situation between Russia and the Ukraine, there's possible sanctions coming both in the U.S. and also in, in Europe. What are your thoughts on this? And, and I want to get your thoughts on this, in, in, especially from the perspective of a, of a utility how concerned are they about, given how important Russia is to the U.S., not, not just the U.S., but also globally for the nuclear industry, but do you think there's some panic going on in the background? Do you think they're okay with the situation? They don't care? They're sitting on enough pounds to last a few years and to ride out this storm or what? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yes, yeah, that's a great question, Jimmy. Um, this might, I don't, it might come off the wrong way, but fuel buyers, what they think um, doesn't drive what I think. I follow the math, they follow the narrative. Except the brighter, they don't get paid to call bottoms, they get paid to secure uranium. They don't get paid to be heroes. They don't get paid to, to put their, you know, uh, to put their neck on the line and say, okay, I'm saying 20 is the bottom, 30 is the bottom. That's not what they do. They're paid to make sure uranium's there. And if they pay what their peers are paying, so be it. And, and I'm not to get into details. It, uranium is, is not, uh, you know, it's single digits. The front end of fuel cycle is 20, 25%. Uranium, depending on the price, could be 5, 8, 10%, somewhere like that, versus coal or gas, which is 80 and 90% of the cost. So they're not paid to, to call bottoms. They're not paid to be heroes. Um, I've been told since I've been in this investment by fuel buyers, uh, in since 2017, going and showing up at nuclear power conferences around the world, that I, I was uh, clueless um, for, for wanting to invest in uranium before we started the fund, and that there's all this uranium out there. There would always be all this uranium. And prices at 18 were not only going staying there, they were going down. And um, I've heard that, uh, but yet I couldn't engage people in the supply-demand conversation where we had, had now we've spent tens of thousands of hours understand the macro. It's another thing I heard recently, some, somebody was calling it noise, I think is what it was, that studying the macro uranium is noise. Uh, I'll take the other side of that bet all day long, that it's not noise, because the price of uranium has tripled while noise has been occurring and, and people are just trying to figure out, we haven't even seen this, the real contracting hit the market. To your question, are fuel buyers panicking? Let's go back to the fuel cycle, three stages of the fuel cycle. Uh, Enrichment's 40% Russia, 27% is conversion, 14% uh, is uranium. Um, so the pinch points, the, the, the places where there's very few choices, there's two entities, well, three, but really two big ones that could enrich uranium right now um, in the West, right? There's, there's tens of mines that can produce uranium. So as, as there's been awareness that there's some stuff going on geopolitically, uh, you've seen people start to talk about moving their enrichment uh, and uh, to to the west. The price of enrichment last year was 50, 55. It's now 135. The price of conversion um, a few years ago was four dollars. It's now forty dollars. Um, it was twenty dollars when the war started, right? So these these things have moved because there's less of them. 
There's only a couple of converters in the West, a couple of converters, uh, enrichers in the West. So fuel buyers last year, you know, the prices were, they doubled in, in, that, in that. So that's where they focused their time and energy. But those two things are services. You enrich UF6, which was U308, uranium. You convert uranium to UF6. And when you look at the inventory levels of those, they've gone down precipitously. They need to re restock those. So the fuel buyers, I think last year in, in contracting, you saw 114 million pounds of uranium under contract and not using our estimates, which were higher on, on demand, but using uh, the consultants uh, estimates, that would have been around 60% of the demand that was out there um, versus 30% to the year before, 25% the year before that. So contracting is accelerating in U308. We think that will just continue to accelerate as utilities have attacked already the enrichment and the conversion. But if you were to call fuel buyers, and we, you know, we see them at conferences, we present at nuclear industry conferences, um, have several conversations, and you know, it's it's remarkable to see some of them still don't believe it. The same people who told us at 18 and 20 and 25 and 30 and 35 and 40 and 45 that we're wrong. I don't know at what point they put the white flag up and say, you guys might have had a clue. Um, and then there's others who are out there securing contracts right now. And those are the ones who we would say are ahead of the curve. And, and it's no coincidence that there's, they're the biggest ones out there, uh, many of them. And so, yeah, we think 2023, we think 2024, 20, 2023, you see an accelerated number off of last year. Uh, and we think that continues. We think that they'll, um, you, you know, you ask about panic. Um, I, I don't like I don't like to use those superlatives because it gets uh, what I think is last cycle they they contracted at a much higher rate than they consumed once they started contracting because they had contracted at a much lower rate than they consumed. It's the same pattern here. The difference is their deficits here versus surpluses last time. So I think that will start to come into play. Mike, that was a nice overview of the supply and demand market. I want to move this discussion now towards the term market. This is the most important market. 80% of all trading occurs in the term market. And according to UXC, 100 million pounds traded in 2021 or 100 pounds, 100 million pounds was contracted in 2021. 114 million pounds was contracted in 2022 and we saw some very strong numbers out of Cameco recently they've already came on they said they have a, an additional 80 million pounds contracted already where do you think this number goes in 2023 you know Jimmy I don't I don't we don't well, I can't give you a number as to how many pounds get contracted. There were 114 million pounds last year. We think it's well north of that this year. We we're already off to a really big start. On the SWU side, right? Last year, there were 23 million units of SWU at enrichment. Think of it, and SWU is a separate work unit. That's a unit of enrichment. Uh, in the first five weeks, you've seen 25% of that contracted. They need the uranium for that. You've seen this big number come out um, already. UXC has doubled the amount of uranium in, from the beginning of the year till six weeks now. They've doubled the amount of uranium they think will be contracted for. Uh, right? They they were starting the year uh, at a much lower number, and now they're at a higher number, a much higher number. So, um, you know, this it, what you tend to see in uranium is uh, it, it, it climbs a wall of worry, right? Um, a wall of doubt, a wall of worry, two steps forward, one step back. So we think that will continue um, at, a, at, a, at a greater pace this year. And, and I just want to go back when I was talking about supply demand earlier, we're looking at all the new mines permitting when they could come in, depleted mines, uh, CapEx expectations, and all of these other things that, you know, we think come in by 2030. We don't, 2035, 2040, you know, that's fairy dust time. I mean, you, who knows, right? We're talking about how much productive economic pounds are out there that can be tapped and you can sign contracts for it. You're going to deliver to those utilities a few years forward. That's what we're talking about.
And given that these utilities have been so aggressive here in the early part of the year, maybe the word is that I, I should be using, maybe it's not panic, but maybe it's more concerned. Do you think utilities are very concerned about what's happening right now? You know, Jimmy, I think, so I, I would say concern, they should, watch what they do, not what they say, right? So one of the things we always look at is one of the consultants out there puts out a, a biannual survey. And if you go back and look, which we've done, I could promise you that, that where is the price going to be in one year and where is it going to be in five years? And in those surveys, they're, they're regurgitating what they're being told by that consultant during the year. And when you look at it, it's always within a couple of dollars, one year out, and five year out. But it just keeps marching higher and higher and higher, right? So um, as we, as, as I, I think those who are aware of the supply demand situation are in their contracting pounds right now. Um, and I, as, as I talk to, I give you, I, I could really give you one example. Uh, one, one particular very sharp uh, fuel buyer, but maybe not, um, it doesn't do really the supply demand work. Um, and, and we see that all, all, all the time. Let's have a supply demand conversation. Um, at $20 was, was telling me that the price was going down and he wanted all spot market exposure. And at $30, I'll never forget, he, he, he sent me an email asking me if I'm doing okay. Um, it was a few years back around Christmas. You doing okay? Price around 30 bucks. <laughs> yeah, we're doing okay. Thanks. Um, that nice guy, but antagonistic. Uh, and because the fuel buyers hate us because we go there. And I don't know why. All we're doing is telling them, look, we have a different view than consensus. We've been asked to speak. We've spoken twice at the Nuclear Energy Institute. We went to the NEI, the largest trade body that represents U.S. utilities in Congress. And we went to the NEI and said, you don't know us from Adam, but let us share with you some of our numbers. And because we think consensus is wrong and a lot wrong. And they looked at it and said, OK, go speak to them. So we went and spoke to a room full of fuel buyers on two separate occasions. And they all looked at us and said, you don't know anything. You're not in the industry. We said, OK, got it. Thanks. Um, now, you tell me what you know. And there's, it's blank, right? Because they just know. Um, and they're in the market every six or seven years. Uh, <clears throat> just like that Kazataprom who could give me $100, $100. Somebody said that they could put $100 million. Well, that's funny because Kazataprom called. Uh, me in January of 2020 to go over and visit with them in London to talk supply and demand. That's really interesting. Um, so um, I'd, I'd love to know where that uh, snap of finger here come $100 million and we'll put the supply online. It's funny how that works. Um, I, I, I think fuel buyers are starting to appreciate that the prices are hitting floors. So that's the first stage, right? It's Is it 45? Is it 50? But it's it's not 30, it's not 35. And 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 they will the and I will say it, the US fuel buyers are far more cavalier in their approach to security of supply than the Western Europeans are. They are much the Western Europeans are out buying a lot more than the US is right now. Some of the sharper ones in the US get it, but they're not gonna tell you publicly, they're not gonna tell you that. Why would they? is they're not going to compete against themselves. They're not going to compete against themselves by talking up the price of uranium when they're out trying to do bespoke bilateral discussions with uranium miners. It's like when they get calls from uh, these expert networks will put, they'll match make, right? Uh, investors with people in industry across myriad industries. If they speak to a fuel buyer, do you think a fuel buyer is going to say, "Yeah, hell, hell yeah, I'm worried. We got to go buy a lot." I'm not going to do that because that that fund is going to go front run them on buying uranium. So you know they're talking their book, and I get that, right? You always have to think about that. So, so yeah, I think you will see. Um, I think there's much heightened awareness. I think what they do and what they watch, what they do, not what they say. We're making the bet, continuous bet that they'll keep doing and, and that there's not an, enough of this stuff out there. It's very simple in my view. It's uh, prices go up when there's not enough stuff, prices go down when there's 
uh, uh, too, too much of it. Interestingly enough, prices were going higher in uranium when there was structural surpluses for a few years, which makes you really wonder where were the, maybe there was, wasn't enough because they would, wouldn't have gone up. So that's where, if, if you're gonna be wrong, if, if you're gonna be wrong and you say, well, geez, there's structural surpluses in the market, but your price is still going higher. Okay, we'll take it. Um, so, yeah. Mike, as we wrap up, I get the sense the price of uranium is going to explode to the upside. You never know what the catalyst is going to be. In 2010, it was the Chinese came in and they started buying. They bought 150 million pounds over the price of a month. They took the price from 30 to 70 dollars a pound. What do you think the catalyst is going to be this time to take the price? significantly higher? I have no idea. Um, I've never really understood or really looked at catalysts for things. I just look at things and say, does the math make sense? We lay it out, right? We've got every reactor modeled. We've got every mine modeled. These aren't numbers pulled out of thin air. This is tens of thousands of hours of work that has convinced me, I think I'm right. I'm not, I don't know that I'm right, but it's been right so far. Uh, and, and the guys that work with me, um, uh, that there's not enough supply, right? So to meet future demand. Um, and how that materializes, you just don't know. I didn't know Sput was coming in the market when it came in the market, but I knew that when things are mispriced, when things are mispriced, things occur. Financial buyers step in, arbitrages occur, because it was a disconnect. You can't sell something at 18 or 20 or 25 or 30 when it costs 50, pull out of the ground. It just doesn't work like that, right? And that was it. The price discovery was set up. You know, Jimmy, you got th this market too. Price discovery is broken. This isn't a real market for price discovery. For you ask a, a few quite times about long-term contracts. In the world of price reporting for long-term contracts in uranium, it's absurd. It's moronic. Example, a, a, a utility signs a contract with a producer, make it up. It's $55, $58, $60. Not far off here right now. But a producer comes in and, and offers 51. The price report on that contract is 51, not where the utility signed. And if you ask the price reporter why they said that, they would say, well, a rational buyer would have paid that lowest price. Uranium's fungible. Well, okay. Um, is the geographic location they come from fungible? Is the counterparty risk fungible? Is the fact that the utility might just want to spread it around and give a smaller producer a chance to produce uranium, is that fungible? No. There's a host of reasons they didn't choose that. It's kind of like you sold your house. If you sell a house for $500,000, but a guy offered you 400, it shows up as having sold for 400. That didn't happen. That's not the market. On, on, a, uh, on, a, on a webcast, uh, one of the, the industry consultant, uh, UXC on a webcast in, in, in November for their clients, which we're one, you know, someone's asked, are prices being done in the, in the high 50s? They said, yes, they are, but their long-term price is 52. So. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. So price discovery is what winds up happening, and, and we argue with them all the time on it. What winds up happening is, you know, the really sharp fuel buyers who are out there securing those 114 million pounds, they're not surprised by pricing, but then you get past those pounds. Then you get past that one or two state-owned entities that is offering lower prices, then they're full. They can't produce. Then you get to the next tier. And then all of a sudden, that fuel buyer who's in the market every six or seven years, because most of their time isn't spent buying fuel, it's, it's spent well, making reactors run better. Um, all of a sudden, they wake up one day and, and price hits 65 or 70. You look back last cycle, they were moving in 10, $15 increments at month to month to month. Why? Because all of a sudden, that 52 offer disappears and now it's 60, 65. And, and they panic. You, you mentioned panic. They start to say, oh shit. They have that oh shit moment. And, you know, um, we're making the bet that happens exactly again this time. Because well, it's like, an uninformed market and you have, frankly, a lot of uninformed commentators on the market. 
I, I see people being interviewed. Um, and again, nobody should, nobody should believe me, do your own work. Uh, don't listen to a thing I say, do your own work, right? It's supply and demand, go put them on a spreadsheet and figure it out, right? If we have money invested in it, we're eating our own cooking. So that's, that's what we think, but everyone should do their own work. But I see some commentators being interviewed and, and it gets around and no, oh, this one said that. What you, the, the, the math is structurally, factually, ridiculously wrong. They're just spewing numbers that make no sense. They're illogical, complete, complete nonsense. So you have to just know, you have to do your own work on it. I don't care if anyone ever believes uh, that we think someone else's work, that we, we observe someone and say, wow, they're opining on the market, talking their book and throwing out numbers that are nonsensical. Awesome. That's just another source of alpha for us. You know, that's another source of somebody just talking, talking uh, nonsense. Mike, given how bullish you are on the price of uranium and where the price is going, I can't let you go without finding out what your target price is on uranium for not only this year, but next year. So, uh, Jimmy, we use uh, in our modeling, uh, we'll use $75 and $80 uranium. Um, you know, like I said, I think that's, you, you know, you balance the market in the 80s now with inflation and all the noise that's happened the last few years, a lot of outdated technical reports. Um, but that's, I think, where the market balances. Um, it, it, like last time it balanced in the 60s, but it went to 137 with surpluses. So here we use that, you know, in our modeling, I think it probably goes higher. Um, you know, I've seen people say it goes to too high. I have no idea. I don't need for it to go there for our limited partners and our funds to to be pleased and for me to be pleased with that. Um, so we try and look at it that way. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I don't know. It will go where the market takes it. The fundamentals are such where we think, again, we could be wrong. I think we're right. We think there's a structural deficit that the market is facing. And, and Jimmy, I should point out I don't mean day-to-day -day facing, right? Because people are now looking at, they look at the spot market. Oh, it was up 25 cents, we're down 25 cents. The spot market is yesterday, that's passing. That was very relevant from 2012 to 2020, when it was, there was huge 20, maybe 20, yeah, 2020-ish. There were still pounds being there. There were still carry trades taking place, right? What's a carry trade? A trader goes out and tells a utility, don't sign a seven-year contract. There's a lot in the market. We'll use our balance sheet, big investment bank, or use our balance sheet. We'll carry it on our books for a couple of years. We'll charge you an interest rate plus a little carry fee. And when you go back two years from now, you'll get lower prices, right? But they had to go to the spot market and buy those pounds. The pounds had to be there, and they were. But that's past. So when I'm talking structural deficit, I'm talking utilities in mass come to can contract what their consumptive needs are on an annual basis. And that's where we think there's a, a large structural deficit. So where prices go will be the mood of the buyers at the time. The first one realizes, shit, I'm out of luck. And I think you're starting to, you're getting there, right? 100, you know, 14 million pounds last year, that up from what, 70, 75 million pounds. It's, it's a meaningful increase. Um, and now they're, they start off the year here. All of a sudden, Amico signs a big deal with Ukraine. Well, those are Western pounds that are out of the market now. Now you got to go replace those. So, um, you know, we'll see. Well, that was a great discussion, Mike. And I want to thank you for spending time with us today. And I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you, Jimmy. And, and again, I just want to go back. People need to understand enrichment math. They need to go in, and when you're talking about requirements, understand that. So thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Well, that concludes another conference, and I want to thank all of our company participants, and I want to thank our corporate sponsor, Sprout Inc., a global leader in precious metals and energy transition investments. We have some amazing conferences coming up focused on the whole energy transition theme, so be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification button so you can be kept up to date on future events. Once again, thank you.